There were 120 different applicants, most of them four-year colleges. Nationally, there were four winners in the first round, the University of Arizona, University of Rhode Island, University of North Texas, and your community college, Northampton, uh, which meant I was able to get on to Washington, receive the award from both the Vice President of the U.S. and also our Secretary of State. Pretty exciting for the college. Um, we also have, and I don't think I've talked to you about this, a wonderful and growing honors program that attracts some of the best and brightest students in this area. Uh, we have 19 different honors courses, 280 students in that program, 17 of them have come out of East End High School. Um, and what it does is it provides an extra oomph kind of at the community college and lots of scholarship opportunities for the students in the honors program. We have some of the finest colleges coming after these students, so more opportunities for our students. We also want to make sure that we're meeting the workforce needs of the community that we serve. Uh, we want a, a national grant from the Department of Labor called <coughs> Act 4, which is a four-year project. We're the lead college on that project, um, along with <coughs> Lehigh Carbon Community College and Luzerne Community College, to do new curriculum development and, and programs around manufacturing, healthcare, and logistics, three areas that we know this community needs. So we're putting all of that in place. Here's just a listing, I won't go through them, of some of the types of jobs that people coming out of these programs are going to be able to move into. Um, we continue to recognize that students need our financial support to come to the college. Fully half of our students need financial aid to come to the college. We have a variety of financial aid that we apply against that. Some of it's private financial aid. Most of it is federal financial aid through the Pell Grant. Uh, about $43 million. We're blessed to have a foundation to support us which allows us to have the largest scholarship program of any community college in Pennsylvania. We've done that part well. Our advancement office, which does fundraising and fundraising for us, was once again recognized as one of the top um, organizations of their type at community colleges across the country. It's the fifth time we've won this award, the only community college in the country to have done that. This is always my favorite slide. I think as I told you last year, every year, only one professor in this entire state is chosen as professor of the year. Public, private, four year, two year, doesn't matter. One professor, two of the past five years, that professor has been at our college. So we've got a great faculty in teaching our young people. Every other year, there's a group called the Aspen Institute that has this competition to name the top community college in the country. They take the 1,300 community colleges nationally, look at our statistics publicly, and then hone that down to 150 across the country. We're the only <coughs> Pennsylvania community college in that 150. Um, we were then later interviewed by them as one of 50 to see if we were gonna be in the top 10. We didn't make the top 10, but we feel pretty good about where we ended up. Um, and our students do well. Six months after they're out, we interview them. Have, are you employed in the field you wanna be in, or have you gone on to the four -year one of the four-year colleges that you might be interested in? And these are the success rates based on what the students tell us. A little bit of a dip in 2011, but we're back up to 91% and feeling pretty good about that. And they go into a whole host of different jobs. These are some <coughs> of the better salaries for median salaries in some of the programs that they come out and go into. <coughs> and they go everywhere in this community. This is just a short list to give you a kind of a quick look at some of the places they go to, but literally you will find our, our students everywhere out in the community. And we do this at an incredibly reasonable cost. The flat rate for tuition at our college this year is $3,840 per year. It compares incredibly favorably to other colleges. And our students transfer to great places. Increasingly, the four-year colleges recognize the caliber of the students graduating from our, our institution and are looking to develop articulation agreements with us. These are just some of the places we have those articulations. So let me talk about East Senior. School District. This past fall, this is what it looks like in terms of numbers of students that came from the East Senior School District to us, a little over 1,200. Uh, the majority of those were part-time, but we had a significant number of full-time. More women than men, not surprising on that end. And then a significant uh, population of uh, students <coughs> of color as well at 46%. So we're excited about that. From the high school, about one out of four, 25.5% came directly to us. Um, and some really great students every year, kind of our hotshot students that come into the college that we then utilize in the president's office for various events, the scholarship support <coughs> coming to us, some of our finest students. And these are some of the students in the past year from Easton that are part of that group. We have four year students, I suspect. We recognize them and <coughs> great students add a lot to the college. I thank you for sending them in our direction. Um, 
Other students from Easton have also been um, kind of have made it into our Phi Theta Kappa Honorary Society, um, which once again opens huge opportunities for scholarships for these students. But you should be awfully proud of them and their success. You have to maintain a 3.5 GPA and be selected to be part of that group. And a number of your students also went into our nursing program, graduating from the RN or the PN program, both of which um, are doing well in terms of their pass rates. Uh, they're exceeding national and state averages. In fact, our, our RN program's pass rate this past uh, year was among the highest in the state, second, I think. Um, and a lot of other things going on in college, I won't go into all of them, but we have wonderful arts programs. Increasingly, our students are transferring in these art programs and doing really well. 50 plus clubs and organizations, 62 to be exact, but across kind of the whole potpourri of different <coughs> clubs you might imagine. Uh, a vibrant arts program, really some exciting things happening. <coughs> and growing athletic program. We have 11 intercollegiate sports and continue to look at new ways to add other sports to what we're doing. And a lot of your students, once again, you probably recognize a lot of the students, are very active on our sports and athletic teams and doing well. Some of them get scholarship offers then to go on to four-year colleges. <coughs> our volleyball team, I just love to brag about our volleyball team, won our, their third consecutive regional championship. Last year they were number five in the country. They narrowly missed going to nationals this year in, in, a, in a tough, tough battle. They've lost a, a total of four games or matches in the past three years. So incredible group of young women. Um, and we also have, we're the only community college in Pennsylvania that has residents all day that have that in the past. We right now have 261 beds. We're expanding that to 300. All of it funded with funds out of the foundation. And then the funds that come from the rents for those students go back into the foundation. So it's separate from any taxpayer dollars, but really opens the doors for students who need that opportunity to have that opportunity. Since we're expanding this year for the first time ever, we're going to allow in-district students that want that experience to have that experience. Of course, right now, it's there are a lot of international students, out-of-state students, and out-of-county students that are part of that. But I just thought I'd show you some of those renderings. In closing, you know, I would just tell you, you know, I've been in higher ed for 37 years. I almost hate to admit that it's been that long. Um, but it has, and I've worked at some great places. I was president of the Liberal Arts College. I worked down the road at Lehigh University for 22 years, leaving as a vice president. And I've seen a lot in higher education, but I gotta tell you, no place that I've been makes the difference this college. And I just wish I could have you on a backpack walking around <laughs> and hearing the stories that come out of our students of all the <coughs> young, middle-aged, and older students. When they cross that stage at commencement and I shake their hand, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm getting cheer I just even think about it. It's life-changing. <coughs> So I want to thank you on the front end for your investment in us. I want to thank the taxpayers for their investment in, in us. I want you to know it matters. The return on investment is enormous. So I come respectfully asking that you continue to support us. We looked at an index of 1.6 as we look across all the different supporting school districts. There's a formula about how many of your students are coming now and has it grown or fallen. When we look at that for you, it's a 1.95% increase. Thank you. Thank you for your support and thank you for all you do. Questions? Anything else for Mark? I think we have to acknowledge John Squash is in the back here. John is also one of the appointees of the board that, that represents us out here at Hampton. So, thank you, John. Thank, thank you, Jim, for coming along. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> the intent is, just as you know, for these budgets that next week are going to be on the agenda uh, looking for your approval. The next presenter, Ron, Dr. Rock. I brought enough. 
Good evening, and thank you for the opportunity to uh, share some information with you tonight from your career in Technical Center, CIT, and Forks Township. Uh, I'll be limiting my remarks to uh, the proposed budget for next year, and uh, certainly be willing to answer any questions that you might have. With me is uh, Mrs. Deborah Miller in the back, our business manager. She's new to us this year. Uh, you might remember Mrs. Mary Ellen Miller. And we figured that when we tell somebody if they want money, we say go see Mrs. Miller. We've been doing that for 17 years. We figured we'd keep Mrs. Miller in the business <laughs> office. And she continues to keep a very close watch on uh, your funds uh, and those of the other four districts. So again, thank you for the opportunity to be here. Uh, what I do for, I, I know one or two of you or perhaps three of you are relatively new to this process. I will walk you through the uh, summaries that I distributed to you. Previously, we mailed to your, uh, to your superintendent's office the detailed budget, which you may or may not have with you tonight. So uh, <coughs> if you're you can certainly ask any questions about the summary or the detailed budget. Uh, and, and so the first page is the budget <coughs> overview uh, that you see there for the entire school. And it compares the projected budget for next year to the current budget for this year. It shows the increase and the percent increase it shows the anticipated revenues that come from a variety of sources uh, and the subsidies that we get from the state for career and technical education. And then right about in the middle of the page there, the actual cost to the five districts of $5.7 million. The increase uh, of, of operating expenses there is a little bit over 4%. And I'll show you in a few minutes where most of that increase is coming from. But then, uh, added to that, we have to collect debt service. Uh, seven years ago, these five districts agreed to do a major renovation at CIT, and so the five districts are continuing to pay for that debt service. So right there below the middle is the, uh, the debt service that is owed. We're actually seeing a nice decrease this year in our debt service because of refinancing that we did, so that's a big help to us. And so they're bolded in yellow the entire total package of $8.7 million, and uh, the change in the cost to the districts, also bolded in yellow, is 2.46%. Our goal was to try to keep it under 2.5%, and, a half percent, and uh, barely uh, we were able to do that. At the bottom of this page, you'll see that we are also proposing, and I'll show you a detail of this in a few minutes, a detail uh, of proposing to return to the five districts 126 plus uh, in unspent money from the 12-13 uh, school year. So if you factor that into the fact you know that you're paying more, but you're also getting some money back, the actual net effect is just over half a percent increase. So that, that's certainly a good thing. In addition, the districts receive reimbursement for that debt service. So that's money that you see regularly as income uh, that is not part of our budget, even though you pay us for the debt service you receive. And again, I'll show you your breakdown of that in a moment. Any questions on that particular one? That's the baby picture, and now I'll focus in a little bit more carefully on the details. Um, this is the kind of complicated spreadsheet that determines how much of that budget Easton pays, Wilson pays, Nazareth, Banger, and Pinard pay. And it's broken down into two sections. The very top is the eligible enrollment, meaning a larger school has a larger eligible enrollment than a smaller school. So 20% is based on eligible enrollment, or the size of your population. Just below that is the three-year average enrollment. 80% of the budget is based on pure enrollment. The more you send, the more you pay. And that's the way it's always been. However, those two numbers, um, the top meaning the eligible, and then next meaning the actual, they get averaged. So if you look there under Easton, you have 40% of the eligible enrollment, you have 35% of the actual enrollment, so that means your share is right there in the center, 36.5%, I believe it is. And that's how um, it's determined which 
which, what each district pays of the total budget. Underneath that middle section, it shows a comparison to last year. It also pulls out the subsidies <coughs> that you will receive, and it shows at the bottom, uh, not to the very bottom, but just above the very bottom, where you see Bagger, Easton, Nazareth, Penarzo, and Wilson, um, the change, the increase, and the percent increase. Now, that's just the operating budget. Remember, I said we have to add debt service to that. So the actual debt service is at the bottom of that page. And if you flip to the next page, please, this shows um, the debt service as well as your expected subsidies. And at the very bottom of this page, the bottom line is your share increases from 2.4 million and plus to 2.5 million, uh, $103,000 increase of 4.2%. Now I told you that the cost to the district was going up 2.4, but your cost is going up 4.2. And of course the reason is your enrollment has been increasing as has Bangor's while some of the other districts has, has dropped. And over time, in any given year, some districts are seeing a greater <coughs> increase than the average, and some districts are seeing a lesser increase than the average. If you go back over five years, it's, it's very interesting. Uh, over the last five years, four of the five districts are almost all the same in terms of some up and some down. Wilson has actually seen steadily increasing costs because their enrollment has steadily gone up. The other four districts have seen some ups and downs over the last five years. And over that time, uh, actually, for example, your, your average over the last five years is an increase of 0.6%, just over half a percent, because you had a couple years with a decrease because your enrollment had dropped a little bit. And again, it, it shares between, uh, among all the five districts. So that's how your share is determined uh, with this complicated spreadsheet. Keep in mind on this page, at the top there where it says uh, debt service and reimbursement, uh, $26,000 and $60,000, those two numbers are income that you will receive uh, completely separate from and in addition to this budget. That's the subsidy on your debt service. Questions on the spreadsheet? Okay. Um, this is the uh, standard codes that you see for accounting. Uh, this is the same codes that your <coughs> school district budget is based on. And uh, if, you know, if you look at the very, uh, the very top going across there, the largest significant increase is employee benefits. Uh, and that's what we're all dealing with. Uh, health insurance costs as well as uh, retirement costs. And so almost everything else is either at a, at a a decrease or a very, very minimal increase because those are the areas where we had to find places to cut and trim and do everything we can, uh, as well as uh, maintaining as, as careful as we can the health insurance costs. We are a member of a trust, uh, which three technical schools, the intermediate unit and seven <coughs> school districts. And because of that trust, uh, we've been able to maintain better than average health care costs. And we have uh, money available to us because at the end of the year, if we don't use it, we keep it in a reserve instead of it going to the profit of the corporation. And so the, that, that's helped us. So those health care increases are actually less than they should be, but because we have a healthy balance, we're able to keep those increases down a little bit every year. And you're going to see in a moment, we're asking to put money aside into that health care trust to help keep future increases less than average. And that is something we did last year and we're asking to do again this year. So this is the, uh, the again, the, the, the comparison of this year to last year using the accounting codes. And if there are no questions on that, I'll move to the next slide, please. Uh, I mentioned this just a minute ago. Uh, two years ago, we had uh, 300 and $26,000 remaining at the end of the school year, which um, comes back to the five districts in, in the percentages that you paid us. However, we're asking, again, to transfer 100000 into the capital reserve and 100000 into 
the benefit trust that I just referenced a moment ago and return $126,000 to the school districts. If that is approved, as you see up there, uh, you would receive $44,913 coming back to the district. Um, the reason, again, for putting some money aside is to help offset future needs. Uh, capital reserve can be used for building needs as well as equipment needs that are significant. And so by putting a little bit aside each year, that helps us keep those costs down when we get to that. Um, so you might ask, uh, well, why did you have $326,000? That's a lot of money. And if you go to the next slide, um, if you look down at the very bottom, $326,000 is 4.8% of our budget. So we were 95% we were accurate, but that's not good enough. Now if you go back up to the top, there are some very important reasons why we have money left over every year. Some of those reasons we can't really control. The first one is we had some staffing changes and we, uh, we left some positions unfilled. We didn't plan to do that, but we did that. Saved $73,000. The health insurance and other benefits associated with those positions, as well as we had several employees who choose to not take their health insurance. They're entitled to it, and they can come back tomorrow and request it. So the money has to be in the budget. But when we don't use it, it comes back to you. So it's part of that $69,000 there. Other benefits associated with those positions, such as Social Security, retirement, unemployment, $52,000. We saved uh, $58,000 on electricity. You heard me say that last year. Every year since we installed the solar energy system, we've been saving money. And it would be nice to just drop it all away. But you remember last year was a very cold year. Uh, this year is starting to feel a lot more like last year. And so we're carefully reducing our electricity budget, but we can't take it all out, knowing that it can, it can come back to hurt us. But You'll see there that that year we saved $58,000. And then a few other small items. So $276,000 was for reasons that we really didn't have a lot of control over. And there are significant and important reasons for that money coming back. That's 4.1%. The 49000 there at the bottom, that's a little bit here, a little bit there that we didn't spend uh, Thankfully, we were careful with the money. So yes, we're returning a lot. We had a lot left over, but some of it is for some very good reasons. The actual uh, miscellaneous unspent funds is less than 1%. So I would say that's pretty careful planning and pretty good budgeting. Any questions on that? One more, please. So uh, that brings us to uh, what you're most interested in, and I already mentioned it a few minutes ago. Uh, and that is your share of the budget compared to last year. And what happens uh, uh, at the top, you see there's a significant increase in operating expenses. But then thankfully, because there's a decrease in the, in the debt service, uh, your increase is not as bad as it would have been. Uh, it's an increase of $103,000 or 4.22%. And again, that's because your enrollment has been coming up, which is a good thing. So that's the summary, uh, kind of a quick snapshot of how uh, we determine the budget and, and what your uh, share of that is. Uh, to go back to the beginning, perhaps, we start this budgeting in September. And, and we don't even really know our current year's costs, and we're projecting out a year. So that's another reason why there's some money left over, because you have to err a little bit on the safe side. We didn't even know our teacher salaries in the fall. And we were projecting next year's teacher salaries because they're based on an average of the five districts. And so um, the, the process through the fall, uh, we then work with the superintendents. They, they, they work very hard to uh, make sure that Mrs. Miller and I uh, spend your money as carefully and as wisely as possible and as little of it as possible. Uh, and they do a very good job of that. And so then uh, uh, after several meetings with the superintendents, we take it to the operating committee Typically in um, December this year was January, and then the operating committee, which is made up of several of your members as well as the other boards, uh, 
approve the okay to bring it out to you. And so we are now at the start of going to the five districts. This is actually our first district presentation. Uh, everybody seems to be running a little behind schedule this year. Uh, we didn't have any in January. And so that, that concludes my presentation. I'd be happy to answer any questions about the summary or about the detail that you did not get this, that you have, but I did not show you tonight. Can we answer any questions? I just want to make sure I understand. So our portion is going up 103,000, but we're going to get 45 back. Correct. Okay. So it's really a net of 58. Correct. Just under 2.4%. Correct. Okay. Keep in mind, though, that money coming back is not going to be a constant. And, and our goal Understand. is to. That was going to be my next question. Every year, you, <laughs> last year, the number we were return we were returning was a lot bigger, yeah. and we're getting better every year at cutting closer to being right on target. Yeah. Uh, I can tell you that next year, when I'm here, instead of 326 thousand, I believe the audited numbers that just were done uh, are more like 190 thousand. So, uh, and, and that's a good thing, uh, but there won't be as much coming back next year. So. So my next question was, Mike, is do we, when we put together our budget and our operating plan and stuff, do we, do we expect that money coming back? No. Okay, so it's not included, so this is a, a basically a bonus for us. <coughs> yes. It reduces the right. overall expense. But we'll know the 100000 is a little more than our cap, so to speak. What will the cap? 40000 will offset that and puts us right back where we need to be. Right, just under two point. Anything else? <laughs> and uh, certainly if you have any further questions after tonight, uh, you can reach us uh, to your board members, to Mr. Reinhardt, or call directly. I'll be happy to, to talk with you. Right. Thank you very much, Mr. Thank, Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And moving right on down the list, uh, up and Charlene, floor is yours. Good evening, everyone. I'm picking up the tail end here, I think. Um, people who know me would probably say that's a bad thing. <laughs> I'm going to talk a lot. Um, but I will do my best um, to keep things under control for you. Uh, Mr. Reinhardt came back and said, why are you sitting in the back? And I kept thinking about that while Mr. Roth was talking. And I think after all these many years, I kind of put rocket boosters in my shoes you know, on budget nights um, to get out of here fast. Um, there's no easy way to come and ask our solicitors for money. Um, and so this is a really tough night for us, but um, I think that, as you've seen by the two presenters ahead of me, that we do our very, very best to be cognizant of your budget situations and to control our costs the best that we can for you. Um, you should have, and we did distribute a booklet for you. I did not bring a PowerPoint. I was trying to save time because if I have a PowerPoint, I tend to go on longer. Um, and in that um, booklet, there are um, many pages that give you background information on the intermediate unit and what we do. For new board members, I will tell you very quickly, we're one of 29. We serve 13 school districts in Northampton, Monroe, and Delaware Valley School Districts in Pike County. Um, although we only have 13 school districts, it's very misleading because out of 29, well, 27, I take Philadelphia and Pittsburgh out of that number because they're their own animal. Um, but out of 27, we are actually the seventh largest IU in the state. Um, by the amount of budgets that we administer, almost $200,000 if you include the health trust. By the number of employees we employ, which is 1,400 um, part-time and full-time employees, and also, obviously, by the number of students that we serve. I'm here tonight to talk to you about our general operating budget. Intermediate unit budgeting is very different from school districts and even from vocational career centers. Um, we have 53 budgets um, that we administer on behalf of, behalf of school districts. But the general operating budget is the only one that we're required to bring out to all of our school districts for their approval. The other budgets that we administer are entrusted to the Intermediate Unit Board of Directors for their review and approval. Michelle Price 
um, is your representative to that board. And um, so she's the person through whom you would send feedback. And also we work with your curriculum folks, your special education directors, um, your technology folks, um, the least, uh, not the least of which are the superintendents. Um, and I meet with them monthly. Um, they are the only group I'm required to meet with by law um, for their input and advice. I'm going to skip right to the green pages in your booklet, if you have that with you, and it is set up as a PowerPoint. Um, and I will ask you to turn to page nine, if you would. General operating budget is one of the smallest budgets, actually, that we administer. But it's very important because it funds four of the basic operations of the intermediate unit. It funds <coughs> my office and the business office. It funds the HR department, our human resources department. It funds our curriculum services, and it funds our education <coughs> technology services. This year, um, for the 15-16 school year, we are recommending to all of our school districts a budget in the amount of $3,222,190. Please remember that's about 1.7% of all of the budgets we administer on behalf of our school districts, <coughs> and a total of about $200 million. It represents a 3.2% overall increase to the budget from last year, but of the dollar increase, which is almost $100,000, 43% of that is due to the PACER's retirement. Our medical benefits, we were very fortunate um, to have negotiated movement to a PPO plan, provide, a preferred provider organization plan, and we were able to reduce our medical benefits estimated on actuarial <coughs> studies by 5%. Again, on the expenditure side, the largest <coughs> increase we have is um, our retirement increase. Medical benefits, we have budgeted at a 5% decrease, and we are budgeting salaries this year at 2.2%. Later in a moment, I'm gonna come back to salaries <coughs> for a minute, though. Um, I'll revisit that um, in a few minutes. Legal services, we have decreased. If you recall last year when I was here, we were in the process of negotiating four different agreements and had engaged um, legal services to assist us with those negotiations. We are, I am happy to report, pretty much finished with those. Um, and so we have decreased that amount. We had asked for a very large increase due to that. We are now decreasing that because um, we anticipate that we will not need as much with the negotiations being concluded. Um, we, of course, as you right now, we don't know. We have a new governor. We uh, do not know what we're going to see. He's promising more money for education. We will know the first week of March, I'm sure. But for right now, on the safe side, we are budgeting for no increase in any state dollars. We also, for new board members, have a um, PACERS reserve account. I think many districts did this. They put some money on the side to help offset their retirement increases. We have been using that over a period of years to soften the blow to our school districts for the IU retirement costs. And this year, again, we are building 30% of what we need for next year into the budget, and we will pull 70% of what we need out of the reserve account. So 70, 30, um, for retirement. And then on page 12, I'm really here tonight to talk about the district withholding amount. This is your only mandated payment to the intermediate unit, but for your debt service on the Colonial Academy. Now, Colonial Academy is its own presentation. Someday um, at a committee meeting, I'd love to come down and share with you all about Colonial Academy. Michelle hears about it all the time. We sometimes highlight things that are going on at the Academy in our IU20 newsletter that you should be getting every month. <coughs> but other than the debt service on the Academy, the school district withholding amount to this budget is your only mandated payment to the IU. All of the other services that you receive from the intermediate unit are services that you purchase from us because they are of value to you or because it's a service that you need and cannot on your own provide it for yourself. 
The district withholding amount to this budget is based on a formula for the 13 school districts. It's given to us from the state and it takes into account your wealth in comparison to the other 12 districts and your weighted average daily membership. So with that, let's turn to page 14. It is the white page. It is the summary of our revenue and expenditures. I'm gonna look at the revenue first of all. So you can see interest, anticipated no increase. Um, receipts on their IU sources for new board members. The IU operates many, many services, including professional development and the FTEP Health Trust and all of those types of things that um, contribute money to this budget so that um, we offset costs to you or if it's a service that you're not participating in, you shouldn't have to pay for it. So those other districts will contribute money to the line item receipts of the IU sources. Um, you can see the transfer there from our PCERS um, reserve account. And there is the big item, the support by withholding. This is, again, the amount of money contributed to this budget mandated by the state from all 13 school districts. There is an increase of 2.4% recommended over last year. That generates $12,491. And it is the first increase two-year withholding amount in five years. We have tried to keep it as steady as we could through the economy, uh, economic downturn that we've had. On the bottom of the expenditures, you see the four separate budgets that I mentioned that this budget funds. And if you turn to page 15, you will see the breakdown of that 532,000, almost $533,000 for next year. The Easton Area School District, under this proposal of a 2.4% increase, would see an increase to its mandated payment of slightly less than $1,300. <coughs> if you look at that, Penn Argyle, our smallest district, would see the smallest increase of about $265, and Bethlehem School District, our largest, see an increase of about $2,500. Although this budget is made up of four separate smaller budgets, most people just want to see the big overall picture. And I've provided that for you on page 16, the very next page. This is the summary of the budget by object code. And I said we'd come back to salaries. Let me explain some of these salary figures because they look rather large. Um, in 1415, 13, 14 actually, when I came out to present the 1415 budget, as I said, we were negotiating four separate contracts. <coughs> we budgeted a 0% increase for salaries for 1415. We did see increases for 1415. So what you're seeing in the net column is not just what we, the 2.2% that we're projecting for 1516, it includes the increases that we had to pay out for 1415. Does that make sense? You approve the 1415 column as it is, but we had projected a 0% increase. And then as negotiations proceeded, there were some increases given. And so we have to make up for that. And then for next year, we have projected 2.2% on average. <coughs> the rest of the booklet provides you with a breakdown. Most of this budget as yours is made up of salary and benefits. And on the orange pages, well on the yellow pages, there's a breakdown of the four budgets if you're interested in the detail. And then on the orange pages in the back is more information about the intermediate unit. I will tell you that we provide <coughs> services from professional development to special <coughs> education to outpatient to partial hospitalization to health care, um, the health trust. Um, we are just really, really very, very diverse. I'm very proud of the IU. We've come through the economy um, pretty well. We've not had a single furlough, not on wood. Um, we have not replaced positions, but um, we have not had a furlough. So I think that means that our services are good, that we have kept them affordable over all these years um, with the economic downturn, and that we continue to provide good service for you. 
So again, recommended budget for 15-16 in the amount of $3.2 million, a 2.4% increase, the first in five years to the district withholding amount. The increase to the Eastern Area School District would be slightly less than $1,300. And that total district withholding is divided <coughs> across all the other school districts, um, Penn Argel with the smallest amount and Bethlehem with the largest. With that, I will take any questions that you might have. Any questions? I know one of the things that we do, cyber services, I know Renee is here tonight. Um, I know she's going to do a wonderful presentation. Unfortunately, I can't stay. I have to head to Harrisburg. Um, but again, please know that even though we only have a very short time, and I'm sure your mind on all these budgets is already clouding over um, with all these figures, but please know at any time for a committee meeting, for just a special meeting, or even a regular board meeting, I'd be more than happy to come down and do a a complete overview <coughs> of volume 20 and the services that we provide. Charlene, on your general budget, what you used to do, you used to have a list here of the percentage of, uh, you know, what percentage was of the general versus of all the other budgets for the salaries and everything. But I don't see those percentages anymore. Uh, is that something you can uh, go back and do and send back to us? Page 21. 21 has it? Yep. The employee positions by program. Is that okay. what you're looking for? Actually, you used to, I think you used to have a percentage there saying 70% of my salary was for this, 30, you know, 15 it, here, 10 there, and so on and so forth. That's what that so, is. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so there's a general operating okay. budget and the force of budgets. Okay. TS is tech services. Because your budget, your salary alone used to be spread across some of those others. Um, not my salary, some of the others. But what we've tried to do, we had feedback from the superintendents who said we'd like to see all those salaries in the general operating budget, not spread out over all of those. So we have moved over the years where we've had um, room in the budget and so forth. We've moved most of the salaries into the general operating budget. There are still a few there that are legitimately charged to some of those other budgets. Right. But we've break <coughs> into that. Okay. Very good, thank you. Good question. Uh, if, I thought I, I, if you could uh, just educate me here. Something I, I maybe it's too detailed. Maybe you could give it to me in an email. I'm just looking at the salaries here. I see director for the director of uh, business services, and I see director of technology, and I see this uh, anomaly as far as pay goes. In that. Um, I'm assuming there must be a reason for that. Why that is. I'm not really even worried about the decrease. I'm just wondering why it doesn't line up with the director. So I'm thinking about what are the responsibilities of that. It's a uh, really, position. really good question. It ties right into what Bob just was asking about. If you look, for example, one of the things about the IU is we have all these different budgets. And so people serve all kinds of budgets, and it's very complicated. We charge different amounts of people to various budgets that, you know, where they're providing service. So, for example, um, for the technology, the coordinator of ed tech services, you'll see that that's about 36680 for next year. Okay. Okay? But if you turn back to page 21. Okay. And if you look down mm -hmm. at the third from the bottom, coordinator of education technology services. Mm -hmm. Do you see that? Mm -hmm. Third? Oh. Yeah. Right. So okay. that's what you're seeing is only 50% in the general operating budget. Okay. But that person serves all of our departments in technology. So he's also charged 50% to the technology services okay. budget. Okay. Okay. And that's why we provide that page. Okay. Um, the IU does not have one big general budget. <laughs> Wish we did. Um, <laughs> but we don't. And so we have to, you know, portion people out to the proper budget. Okay. Okay. So it makes sense. I, I, yep. know, I know it what was you're a great doing question. I, 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 it and just stuck out a little bit. Absolutely. You know, I knew there was an easy answer. And that's why we put that page in there. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Any other questions for sure? No? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. It was good seeing you again. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
thanks Mr. Uh, Semino to provide us with uh, and uh, And we will be interested in the guest who are here to present our uh, well, first is the um, proposal to uh, renew for our wide area network. Um, and I'm sure that I will have to uh, refer to uh, Sue Stem for any specific questions, but essentially, it's time to renew, and Sue, um, we just have to have time going out there. As a matter of fact, we were at the same time, the IU uh, was doing a consortium uh, bidding. We had thought that um, we were going to uh, we didn't know. We thought we'd be better off going into the IU. Uh, the more districts, uh, the, the lesser cost. But uh, Sue's uh, negotiating uh, techniques prevailed. And RCN came in at uh, actually an amount less than the consortium would be at the IU. Uh, you'll see here on the paper that um, we are increasing our, our bandwidth up to one gig, which is five times what we currently have, and we're going to spend less. And one of the, um, one of the major uh, factors about going with RCN is in three years, so please jump in. In three years, we have the ability to increase to two gig at the same cost or if we want to stay, if we think we're good where we're at, if we want to stay at the one gig, we will have a reduced cost for the remaining two years. Um, additionally, um, going with RCN, we are our own entity. We will deal directly with the provider. Going through a consortium, there is a couple steps. We're in an emergency, we're in a situation where we need immediate attention. There are several steps to do. So the recommendation is that we uh, contract with RCN um, for our wide area network services. Any questions for Mike on that? Okay, next one, Mike. Software. Okay, software package. Um, for those that were here, uh, when I came on board a couple years ago, I, uh, one of the first projects that I wanted to address was uh, upgrading our software package in the business office. We have a system, as you see, um, the reports that we get monthly are very bland. Um, the reporting aspect of our system, we currently have innovation. The reporting aspect is cumbersome, uh, very hard to, to understand, and uh, hard to maneuver through, uh, even in the business office. <laughs> so I've been looking at several software packages over the years. It just seems like every year, um, it's just crazy time of year in the spring when we want to recommend something with the budgeting. We took advantage of this year's <coughs> when we are not going kind of crazy and put together um, a, a recommendation to go with Skyward. Um, we had the entire uh, business office. I think HR was involved. Um, we, uh, most of everybody in this building had a presentation from Skyward. Very, uh, very detailed reports easy to maneuver through the system. Um, they have negotiating components. They have updates that are automatic in prices. Um, so everything about them, we have a couple of districts around us. Wilson and Bernard were just went to Skyward last year. Uh, they're very, very happy with it. Our auditor is familiar with Skyward and their programming. A couple of the new things we're going to get is uh, a time, time stamp, time card, doing away with that paperwork uh, in the near future. Um, the other thing is our current system of animation, we are in need of an upgrade for a server. Uh, and also, the software needs to be updated. When animation was bought in 2008, it was not implemented until 2010. And even in 2008, that software was already a couple of years old. So we need an upgrade. The upgraded version that Animation currently has is already a couple years old. So we'll be upgrading, we we'll need to upgrade a couple years, but we need to do that for the server. So the server alone is going to cost us, and the upgrade of the software and the server alone to Animation on basically a program that we're not happy with is going to cost us $75,000. One of the advantages of Skyward, the initial 
package is going to be $200,000. They're willing to finance that over three years at 0% interest, which I think is a plus. Additionally, we will, once we pay that initial cost, our yearly uh, maintenance fee, license fee, will be approximately $18,000 less than what we'll be paying with renovation. So I would like to uh, ask the board if they would allow me to um, move forward with this on the agenda next week. We'd like to implement this for July 1. Are there any questions for Mike? Just be clear, just, we do not have our own servers anymore. We're going to be dependent on them. They will be hosting. Uh, so if yes. they're down, we're down. If they're down, we're down. They have, um, and you'll see in the contract, if you haven't seen it, they have provisions for downtime. They have never experienced, uh, you know, this was a power failure. Everybody else, but it's, if we're down with our own service, we have the same issues. Uh, there's the them hosting it, the, the updates, the software, everything is immediate. So um, we feel that that's the way to go. It's also cost effective for us. <coughs> and even in the long run, five years from now, we don't need to upgrade our service. Any other questions from Mike? Mike, you said you uh, was it Wilson and Nazareth? Wilson and Bernard. Wilson and Bernard. And you've spoken to people directly there and that they have not experienced any unusual downtime? Well, just, just the, you know, implement, no, downtime, no, absolutely no. not. Uh, but the initial implementation, you know, there's always those, those hiccups. Yeah. People learning, but downtime, no. No, oh, you, you already said we're going to do that over the summer. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right, thank you. Any other questions from Mike? Okay, moving on to F, the lab equipment. Uh, Project Lead the Way, uh, Mr. Cast, uh, we have um, uh, new software, new programming in Project Lead the Way uh, grant that Mr. Cast purchased. Uh, unfortunately, the two of the three labs, one has just been upgraded last year. The other two labs are in severe need of upgrading equipment, uh, approximately uh, 36 computers. And um, we need to upgrade both labs for that curriculum um, the, we thought about trying to get into the lease, it's just not going to work out with the numbers. And uh, in talking with uh, Angel, Angela DeVitro and, and Heather, we received additional funds this year that we were not anticipating and ready to learn group. If you recall, the governor threw that money in after our budget was set. And we have some money there where we're recommending that we purchase and update that lab for its adjusting so he can continue with that project in the way uh, working. Angie, is there anything you like to add? Yeah, actually will um, support all of the technology education uh, software in, in the two labs. And without this new upgrade, they can no longer run the software needed for the next year. Right. So if you know, the project needs to run the other tech and courses, it's going to to continue without the upgrade. We did uh, look at the money's available. I spoke with the cabinet. Last, I think it was five or six years once we do the upgrade. Mm -hmm. right. So it's not out of our actual operating budget. Other questions? Okay, at this point, so if there's anybody in the audience that wants to address the board on any of the agenda items or any of the finance agenda items, I ask you please start the podium. I'm seeing no hands. Therefore, we can put some. Ah, there you go. Please, your name and address, please. Should I write that down? Uh, you should sign in there. Yes, and also state it. Uh, okay. Well, I'm a Connor Ryan. I live on 729 Meter Street on Calgary.
put me ahead of the curve than other engineering students who apply at the same university. So it gives you an academic edge that I appreciate. Seeing none, in summary, all the items around the finance agenda will be moved forward to the regular board meeting for next week. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> we will now be <coughs> assuming the initial order of one hour agenda and moving over to the academics uh, committee meetings, which will be led by Ms. Price, who is the chair. Yeah, I'm starting off with Mr. Beecher. Um, so we're starting off. Hi, good evening everyone. Uh, this evening we are going to have three vendors present for Cyber School. Our <coughs> fourth vendor, um, Edges here, decided not to participate at this time. They felt that they weren't able to provide what we needed, so they did drop out of um, presentation. So I did provide all of you with the 35 questions. I just want to remind you of this. I know it's a lot. I asked all three vendors to please answer the questions that our subcommittee um, and the administration came up with, and they did. They answered the question, so it's all here for you. Um, so I was hoping to cut down some time, so they, I asked them to be very specific with their presentation, no more than 10 minutes, and then if you have a few questions afterwards, please ask. Don't give them a hesitate to ask. So our first presenter is from Ebridge Academy. His name is Bob Schaefer, and he'll be presenting uh, first this evening. Thank you for your time tonight. I too was a school board member. I know the famous hours <laughs> that you put into what you do. So I appreciate your time tonight uh, to be able to present the program to you. Now we get the technology to work with you. Okay. Here on behalf of the Ebert Health Associates, that is the parent company that I work for, and what we do are very similar to an IU program, but at a much smaller scale. We go out to uh, superintendents across the state to see if um, there are needs at school districts <coughs> for any kind of educational services we, we provide. Uh, I came on board with eBridge um, about four years ago. And we started a career employment program at the same time. So eBridge was born because of the need of cyber education to help our, our, our districts to, to lower the cost that they're exceedingly feeling from the cyber charter schools. So that's where we came from. That's where we're going from. I did have an opportunity to work for two years for Connections Academy. So I got to see some of the good side of cyber education, some of the bad side of cyber education. And when we build this program, we kind of combine the two together, give a, a good program that we feel 
districts can be very happy about. Um, first thing we use, and this is kind of sets them apart from some of the other cyber education that's out there, we do require our students to log in between the hours of 2, 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. daily. We do give them a half hour for lunch, and we do monitor the attendance that for each day that the student is online, okay? We get every Monday, whoever the point person is, guidance counselor, etc. we will make sure we provide the, uh, the attendance for the week to that person and work with you as far as if the student is truant and there's uh, files, you have to file charge of the magistrate, we will work with you, give you the documentation, etc. even come down here and attend that hearing for you if we have to. Now what this does is this allows us to be able to talk back and forth with every one of our teachers online. So I did ask a teacher to be on lunch line tonight. So this is our social studies teacher. And you can see this gives you a chat program back and forth to connect with the, te with the teacher one-on-one -on -one through a text chat program, okay? In addition to that, we do offer voice over IP where we can actually call the teacher and talk with the teacher one-on-one -on -one online. Hello, Mr. Horton, how are you? And so we also have a video component that we do with all of our laptops as well. So you can have a video component and be able to see the person you're speaking with. So we do, we do have the opportunity for the students to connect with us three ways throughout the day. And they can connect with us any one of those three ways. We're there from, we are there from 7.30 until three. So we're the students online from eight to two. So it does allow for some, an hour and a half worth of time to be able to uh, connect with the students outside the school time as well. So almost tutoring hours, okay? One of the ways we can track attendance, if you look over here, you have a green button. That green button will tell us that the person's online and active. The student logs into the program and goes to the movies or to the mall. That green button will become a yellow button within seven minutes of moving, not moving the mouse. So we know that that student has left the computer. Okay? And the gray buttons will tell us that they are not logged in at all. We do use Blended Schools. I know that's one of your next presenters, but we do use them for our curriculum needs. Um, we, they do have over 177 online classes. They are all aligned to the Common Core. They do have access to the Language Institute uh, that they have as well. And we do offer K-12 education. Blackboard is the model we use that's used for 98% of colleges across the country in their cyber education. So if you've taken an online course at any point in time, you've probably used Blackboard or are familiar with how to use Blackboard. We do have, every day we have live lessons that our students attend throughout the day. We use a, a web conferencing tool called Blackboard Collaborate, which allows our students to connect and come into a virtual classroom and work with our teachers there in a virtual classroom as well. This is a opportunity for them to also see their classmates and to collaborate whereas the instant messaging is a just a one-on-one -on -one with that teacher. And we find that a lot of the students that are struggling academically are struggling because they don't want to ask questions in the classroom. They, they feel ostracized, they feel in the back of the room. So having that opportunity to connect one-on-one -on -one really resonates with that. Um, again, we require students to log in 82 daily, and we do a, a report the attendance each week to the local school district. Now we do have an asynchronous program as well, and that is uh, if the school district comes in and says, look, we have a student that has a specific uh, student a need. We have a student at Northwestern Lehigh who is a farmer, who works on the farm during the day and attends our classes at night. All of our live lessons are recorded and they connect, can connect with the teacher via email. So they lose the one-on-one -on -one connection there, but they still have access to all the courses and still have the ability to ask questions at that. You make the determination. We don't make that determination. Any student that is referred to us, we automatically bring in on the eight to two program and we monitor that student's attendance. We do provide each student with a laptop printer and scanner. 
Now, some of the things that we will do, um, again, not being on a school board, I know that the, 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 the money that's exchanged between cyber charters and school districts. So we will not market to students and parents that are enrolled in your district. You're not gonna see us on a billboard on 78. We're not gonna see us in your, in your lunch room saying, hey, come to Ebridge Academy. Um, I did see a competitor online this week on Facebook um, requesting students from this actual local district, which kind of floored me. But we do not market to those students. We take referrals only from a, a designated person in the school district. We have an online referral program. The student comes in, the parent comes in. Some districts hold an initial meeting with that student to see if they might be successful in a cyber program. Then they make the referral to us. We will come here to hold the meeting. We will drive here. We will meet the student and the parent face to face. It's about an hour meeting. We go over all of the attendance. We go over our policies. They get a handbook. And then we get the courses that you would like them enrolled in that are equivalent to what we can offer. And then we, we, we go over the actual program, how to use it, how to submit things, etc. We do market to your students currently enrolled in cyber charter schools. Okay? That is something we will do. Um, one thing that we do with Wilson uh, School District across the way is we, uh, every year, we send out a, 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 a letter inviting the parents to an open house. And we sit with the students, the, the parents, go over the program, ask, you know, answer any questions that they might have, show them the online chat program, show them our, our curriculum, what, what can benefit them from coming back from a cyber charter school to a public school setting. Okay. So I kind of stopped there for a second. Do what I mean. Our cost. Sure. Our cost for our program is it's twenty five dollars per day. The student, you only pay for as long as the student is enrolled. I have had students that I met at Pottsville School District at 5 o'clock p.m. and by the time I had gotten home, called and said, I'm not interested in cyber school. We didn't charge for that person. Okay, That happens when they see the program and they understand the amount of work <laughs> that's involved with the cyber chart or cyber program. They sometimes will back out and say, I would just rather stay with the local school district. When you're losing a cyber charter, it's tougher because they're doing all the initial paperwork first. They're, they're transferring their records. They're transferring their immunization records. They're doing all that stuff, so they kind of feel obligated at that point to attend the cyber charter school. So that's because the, student is, the, the students are still with the district. They can make that determination that, hey, I want to stay in school. This is a lot more tough than I thought it would be. So you're only paying for the amount of days that they're enrolled. So if they're enrolled for four days, you pay us $100. There's no upfront fee, there's no upfront cost, there's no cost per quarter, there's no cost per, per marking period. It's just forever how long that student is enrolled in the program. Okay? We do offer two other programs as well. We have a summer online program. We run summer school for a four-week period, so what we do is block off a four-week period for Easton. The students would, you, you would, again, go through a process. Most of the time, school districts, obviously, the parents pay for summer school. We do have an online program for that as well. We come down here, we hold two big parent meetings, one in the morning, one in the afternoon. Go over the program, how to log in, they get their username and password, and then they go on their way. That is a four-week program that we block off specifically for your school district. Okay? The next thing we do is uh, we have credit recovery program that we run for this entire school year. That runs concurrently with the school year. This um, allows a student that might be working, that have failed a class, maybe they're a senior, and they failed the first half of the uh, English class, and they want to make sure they graduate on time, they can take the first half of the English class, again with us, to gain the credit for graduation. So it does help towards your graduation rate as well. Okay. Sure. Special education. We do have uh, special education teachers on staff. We will assume the IEPs if that's so wished by the district. Uh, what that means is we take the IEP, we, as, long as, a, um, as long as we have to do any psychological evaluations for the, for the RRs, 
Um, we will do all that work as well. And then we will come here to actually hold the IEP meeting here in the district, if that's something that Ethan chooses to do. What do our parent startup meetings look like? This is often asked to me at the district. We have a face-to-face -face meeting. Somebody will come here and meet with a student at whatever, whatever school they're from. We'll come to that school, meet with that parent face-to-face. -face. We do provide handbook to give them all the, the materials. We do uh, offer progress monitoring. What will happen is, if you look up there, you're going to see this is today's progress note. This is one from a, a local school district as well. And what we do is we send this to your guidance counselors, and they get a chance to see the progress of the student every 10, 20, and 35 days. So if they want to make a determination that that student should not continue in cyber education, and look, we gave it a shot and it's not working, they can go ahead and make a recommendation to have them come back. My boss is getting out when I tell you this, but I will make the recommendation for them to come back to school. It's not benefiting you, the student, or me to have a student that's in my program fail. So you'll see in that, on that progress note, one of the recommendations is to have the student return to school. Review removed from the program. Now, obviously, we don't make that determination. That's something that the school district determines and, and makes that determination. But that's something that we do, and we feel very, very important to be honest about that kind of thing. <coughs> okay, we are, like I said, 25 day per, or 20 hours a day per diem. In the event that a student leaves the program, you're only billed for the amount of days he's actually, or he or she is in the program. No long-term contract. You're not signing anything up front, licensing fee or anything like that. You pay for what you use. All right, and I know you have a list of questions. I do have some references too I'd like to hand out if you guys would like to to call and a list of the school districts that we currently service as well. Do you have any questions at this point? I have about just one. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, one of the questions that came up was uh, at ESA, Eastern Area District teacher courses are customized courses, and, and your response is that we got in our videos that no, the teachers will teach the courses are enrolled. Mm -hmm. Is there any flexibility in that? We, we do not have flexibility in that. We just think we could not make that work. Okay, okay. Our teachers come into our office every day. Mm -hmm. So, any questions that arise, any problems that come up, you know, any anything in a variety of day you can run into you know obviously tech problems all the way through you know i'm missing a, I'm missing a half a credit my guidance counselor didn't tell me any of this where we do now you know so we get all kinds of questions throughout the day so it's nice to be able to connect with those teachers one-on-one -on -one to make sure that that can happen um, do you have any idea of how many students that have gone out previously to cyber schools you've been able to pull back in i would say probably we were able to pull back about 10 percent of the students that are out in cyber charter. Well, I find mostly the, the high school students are a little easier to bring back because a lot of times the parents don't know that they're getting their diploma from their cyber charter school. They don't know that they can't uh, go to the prom or homecoming. So those are marketing tools that we can use to bring back the students to, this, to the local school district. Um, for you guys, it's obviously the, the, the money value that, that you get from that, but for them, they're looking for a different value, so we have to market it kind of differently, you know, to those students. Do they look at you differently than the, the charter school or the cyber school? A lot, of, to? a lot of times the answer I get is, I didn't like that school district anyway, I'm not coming back there. So they, they view <laughs> us as being with the district, so they think we are extension, you know, of the district. So their assumption is, or, you know, somebody, somebody made them angry down, you know, in the past, and they left to go for whatever reason. So that seems to be my biggest place where I get the biggest pushback. Um, trying to convince them that you know these are different teachers, this is a different curriculum, this is you know something new that Easton has on board. So normally that's the, honestly the biggest gripe I hear from parents. Well, I love the school district because of this person or because of that person. So it's hard to convince them to you know come back at that point. That's about as candid as I can be. <laughs> I believe I'm politically correct as I can be. <laughs> All right. I thank you for your time. Thank you.
I'm sorry, the next one. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Andrew's back. Good catch. Okay, next is uh, Mark Entmore. He's the presenter from Blended Schools. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Mark Gensmore. I'm the Vice President for BlendedSchools.net. Um, I have a little handout here. Uh, it tells you a little bit more about our curriculum, but more importantly, if you look on the back, is a list of all of our courses uh, that are available. I'm just going to do a short presentation, give you a little bit of information about us. But please feel free at any time to go ahead and ask any questions. So, I know tonight you're looking at your online academy, and again, a lot of our school districts uh, across the state and across the country actually use us for their full online academies, online schools. But blended schools can be used for so many more things. Whether you're looking at homebound students, credit recovery, uh, gifted acceleration, or just to use in the regular uh, uh, blended classroom, uh, our, flex our program is very flexible enough to meet all of those needs. Um, and when you're thinking about creating an online program, you really need these five major things. Um, you're going to need the curriculum, uh, which our curriculum is developed by highly certified teachers. Um, all of our curriculum is built by ourselves. We do not use any third-party content providers um, within our content. You need the technology to deliver it, and again, highly engaging, interactive LMSs and synchronous tools. Um, professional development to train your teachers to deliver uh, that online or blended instruction. And of course, instructors to teach those students. And then the support to support the curriculum, the technologies, and so forth. Now, all of those are needed, but the one that's going to differ in the two models I'm going to show you is the instruction. It's whether blendedschools.net is going to teach your students or if you're going to teach your own students. And I know, like many of the other school districts around this area, um, Bethlehem, Catasauqua, Southern Lehigh, and so forth, uh, a lot of them, again, are teaching their own students because that's what you do. Um, we have a complete curriculum, as you can see, of all the courses in the back listing there. Um, again, over 200 plus uh, semester-based courses, units, videos, lessons. We use the understanding by design process to develop all of our curriculum. And again, there are lesson packages within the courses. So it's very modifiable in the fact that the teacher can go ahead and change the scope and sequence of the course, um, or if the teachers want to, they can build up only uh, they can put in any of their own content and build content around our content. So it's very flexible in the fact that they have full access to the learning management system to develop what they want and use what we have the way they would like. 
Um, again, our courses have won several awards. Um, again, mainly for the alignment to the INACL standards. If you're not familiar with INACL, it's the International uh, Association for Online Learning. Uh, they come out with standards for in, uh, instructional design, but also implementation of blended and online learning programs. Uh, you also notice one of those is actually one of our uh, professional development courses. Um, what makes our quality of content gold standard? Again, consistent lesson structure, no matter if the students in a math, science, or social studies, the navigation is going to be the same. Diagnostic tools, interactive lessons, auto scoring for knowledge and comprehension. But again, we have higher level thinking skills, including full project based assessments available at the end of each unit. Uh, so we are looking at hitting on all. Uh, the um, higher level thinking skills. And again, when you're looking at the instructional design, uh, collaboration and communication tools are extremely essential in all that. So next, the technology. Uh, you actually have two different packages to deliver our curriculum to your students. You can either, oops, excuse me, this is your Wi-Fi thing. You can either use our Blackboard Learn Learning Management System, um, and with our Blackboard package, you also get Blackboard Collaborate, what gives you full uh, capability to deliver live synchronous instruction online with a full interactive whiteboard, audio, <coughs> video, and so forth. And again, you also get access to Blackboard Mobile, so your students can access any of our content from any mobile device. All of our content is uh, extremely mobile friendly. In fact, all the videos are HTML5, not Flash, so it'll even work on any iOS system. Um, you also get access to Blackboard uh, Collaborate Mobile, which means your students can actually attend live sessions using their mobile devices. Um, or you could choose the Canvas Learning Management System package. Uh, Canvas is another uh, uh, platform that we also provide. We partner with each of these. Um, again, all of our curriculum is in both of those platforms. Um, you also get access with the, uh, with the Canvas platform uh, Big Blue Button, which is a full collaborative tool for live interactive instruction, and of course, Canvas Mobile. Now, all of our curriculum is cloud-based that integrates into these LMSs, which makes us uh, the ability for us to update our content at any time, improve, manage effectively across all of our school districts, whether you're Lambertsville in California, the coast in Wisconsin, or Easton here, our content is fully, um, again, supported at, uh, from the point of being cloud-based. As um, far as professional learning, again, uh, have your teachers been trained on how to teach in a blended or online learning environment? And this is one of the main things that we try to do, is train your teachers on how to deliver full online or blended learning environments. Uh, we have trainers, uh, <coughs> certified trainers. We help you with your implementation plan, what you're looking to do, and create a professional development plan so that you can move from the beginning to your end goal. And again, when I say professional development, it's just not coming in and doing a training, okay? This is long-term embedded professional development, making sure your students are progressing at the pace they need uh, to become those uh, teachers. Um, and of course, we have fully online professional development too. Uh, we even have um, uh, administrative program for leaders on how to lead a program, how to teach online, how to teach in a blended learning environment. And again, these are just some of the training opportunities that we provide, but truly the long-term professional development plan is really what is important. And finally, support. Um, we do all the hosting and tech support of all the LMSs. We have a 99.9% .9 SLA, which is service level agreement for downtime. Um, and that excludes uh, updates or maintenance, which only ever occurs on a Sunday night late. Um, and so really what it comes down to next is the instructional part. That's the one thing I really didn't go over. Um, you have two choices. We provide you everything you need, the curriculum, the technology, training for your teachers and do all the support and then you run your own virtual program. And really, that's what we want you to do. You should be teaching your kids. That's what you do, you teach. However, we know that not every district's ready to teach fully online. They might have teachers trained, whatever it may be. So our Learning Institute allows us to teach your students um, until you can make that transition. And again, we do all ages, elementary through high school. Um, all of our teachers are highly qualified, and they do live online instruction, too. I'll talk a little bit more about that. In our class size per section, there's only up to 20 students. 
And really, we have two options with our Learning Institute. Uh, you can uh, actually do the full synchronous engagement model, which actually means the students are going to meet for live, direct instruction three days a week. I think they kind of like college. Monday, Wednesday, Friday, you're going in to see the professor to do the live instruction, and the rest of the time you're doing asynchronous activities. Um, and then we have the limited synchronous, which basically means they lead, meet only approximately one time a week, um, mainly for either instruction, mentoring, tutoring, and a variety of other activities depending on the student or student's needs. Uh, so again, there's two different models that you can choose from. Obviously, there's two different price points on that too. Uh, so really, um, what we're trying to do is help you improve and expand your learning opportunities, whether it's be a full online academy or whether it be providing uh, Mandarin, Chinese, Japanese, Russian, whatever it may be, uh, in addition. So basically, with your implementation options, the very first option is what I talked about, where we provide you everything you need. The full online curriculum, the technologies I talked about, training for your teachers. I apologize for your network. <laughs> and, all, it's your fault, my mom. <laughs> and all the support services. And basically what you do is you buy a number of users. A user is a teacher or a student, but you have unlimited access to all of our curriculum, unlimited access to all the technologies that we provide for those number of users. You get 500 participant hours of PD, implementation support, and again, unlimited help desk support with that. Now remember, that's the option where your teachers are teaching your students. So you're still going to have instructional costs that you have with your teachers, depending on how you structure that, or maybe it's embedded within their own jobs. Um, the last and final option is the Learning Institute, where we actually teach your students. Think of it as a full outsource. You come to us to provide your um, online and instructional services, and basically it's a cost per semester based course. And those costs differ depending if you want the full synchronous model or if you want the limited synchronous model. Uh, so looking at $325 for a course enrollment where the students would do most of their work asynchronously online, but would still meet for live either instruction, mentoring, tutoring, whatever may need be uh, per week. And then of course the last one there, $475, you're looking at the um, you know the fully synchronous model where they're going to meet three times a week with that teacher for live direct instruction and then still do their asynchronous learning activities. And again, um, full collaboration and communication tools are available, uh, whether they be synchronous or asynchronous tools, flexible curriculum, and again, uh, state-of-the-art technology for delivering that environment. Um, questions? I, that was really quick. <laughs> she said 10 minutes. Yes, I did more that. I, if I did, I'd keep going. No. <laughs> I, we're over by about 20 seconds. <laughs> um, well, that wasn't my fault. It was your network. <laughs> okay. yeah, yeah, you could subsidize that. I'm sorry. Go ahead. What's the difference again between the Blackboard Collaborative and the Blackboard Canvas? Okay, so not Blackboard Canvas. Canvas is a learning oh. management system. Oh. Blackboard is a learning management okay. system. Blackboard. Blackboard Collaborate is the live synchronous right. tool. And Big Blue Button is the one for Canvas. Oh, okay. So you can do live synchronous in either of the platforms. Yeah, that's what I was wondering. It sounded... To be honest with you, I mean, Blackboard is much more robust as far as the tools that are available. Uh, but also with more robust environments, they become a little bit more complicated, maybe not as easy to use. Where Canvas is much simpler, a little easier to use. So, questions? Um, uh, well, one thing, could you, uh, since I didn't really want, I tried to write some down, would sure. you be able to, to email us? Yeah, I, actually that's what I was going to tell you. I was going to email or, Angela and then she okay. can go ahead. Just, just for some of the, the core numbers yeah. and stuff yeah. on there instead sure. of trying to scribble them down. Not a problem. I can, yeah. And, um, so let me just do the, are you looking yeah. at this last slide there? Is there a minimum amount that we have to subscribe to? So, again, yeah, looking at your model here, I mean, you know, the top part was 200 users, and I based that upon how many students you said that you have in cyber school plus your teachers and so forth. Right. Um, but we do have lower user bands than that, down to 100 users. Okay. Uh, so you can change that down to 100 user membership. And that goes along with how many we back into our system. Yeah, a user is just one student. 
Okay, so you could be a student, but you're a user, but you can still take your math, science, social studies, English. You know, that's just one user track. So you can take all your courses, including any electives and so on. Um, now, the, the part below is if you're not teaching your students and you need us to teach them. So let's give you an example. Let's say you have a social studies teacher ready to go and you have a math teacher ready to go to teach online, uh, but you don't have science teachers or you don't have English teachers. Then we can provide that instructional service for that. Per course, it's 325. Per semester basis. Per semester. Okay. Um, is there a minimum amount that we would have to... For the enrollment? No. For the user membership? For the user membership, 100 users is... Uh, or, or minimum you for the top up. part. And yeah. how much would that be? Um, I'd have to look, but you're probably looking around $10,000, $11,000. Okay. So the initial yeah. base fee is like $10,000, and then... As, as, as you move up on your membership uh -huh. fee, you know, there's economy of scale to that. Right. So 100 okay. users, you're probably looking somewhere between 10. Okay. I'd have to look. I don't want to misquote. Yeah. But okay. So does that 100 user then still use the unlimited use of uh, the 200 mm -hmm. courses yes. technology help that yep. support? Yep, and again, teacher. So, for example, a teacher is a user, mm -hmm. but the teacher can be teaching the math, the algebra course, the algebra two course, the geometry course. They can teach as many courses as you as you would like. Okay. So and it's unlimited usage how you use that. And the other thing too, I want to let you know is you actually manage your own environment. So you actually have somebody who's going to manage your learning environment and the courses that students are going to take. So it's not somebody manages the elements yeah. from within. So if we go with Blackboard, we'll have a Blackboard administrator yeah. who will have uh, root access to control everything, right. uh, including, yeah, well, I can tell you what everything is. That's from um, their company. Um, Blackboard's the one I'm familiar with yeah. the most. That's the one. Okay. Uh, I've yeah, used, Blackboard's been around. Use, yeah, I've used to make the button, and I was still for Blackboard. Yeah, I remember. So. Collaborate. I mean, yeah, Blackboard collaborate. Well, no, yeah, the, yeah, the Canvas uses that big blue button. Yeah, yeah. I've used that. I was okay. Uh, I yeah. use Collaborate. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been using Collaborate since it was Illuminate Live. Plus, it's not so. um, mobile friendly if you want to use it. No, that Illuminate, that Illuminate <coughs> mobile is handy. Uh, you said to train the teachers. Uh, is there an added cost with that? Actually, no. You'll see with the membership fee, you get 500 participant hours of PD. So oh, okay. Okay. 500 participant hours means if we can come in, let's say, tra train 10 of your teachers uh, for two days of, let's say, 10 hours total, that's 100 hours. Okay. 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 And then, again, if, uh, one of the things we do is we customize it. So we might come on site to do the initial training, and then what we might do then is have online modules that we'll assign them or do live webinar sessions with mm -hmm. your teacher to, again, extend that training in, in those uh, PD uh, activities. So again, we really customize it. Our school support person will contact you and really sit down and find out what it is that you want to do and then help you set up an implementation plan along with the professional development plan for your teachers. Okay. And, and in this situation now, the students are responsible for their own computer and everything? Yes. Or we do not provide the end user technology. That is correct. Um, again, most of our districts don't really want that. Um, also, when you look at students transitioning back from like, maybe we're teaching them to back to you're teaching them then, um, you know, just the access of the, con of the equipment and so forth. And to be honest with you, most of the students today have their own devices. Um, even the cyber charter schools, most of those computers get sent back to them because they're too locked down for them and the students have their own computers. So even the cyber charter schools, most of those get sent back. If you didn't know. <coughs> Who takes care of the technology as far as if there's any problems? The hardware, software? Yeah, exactly. So the hardware on the end user would be you or the students or whatever. But as far as all the curriculum and our technologies, we provide all the support for that. We do all the hosting. We do all the tech support. You have an unlimited help desk. Um, and again, uh, you have a school support person that also you have contact with. Did you say that you We don't do the recruiting of students, however, we do help with that in your implementation plan. So we help you uh, provide ways in which you can recruit students back. We don't actively recruit, okay? We really want that recruiting to come from you, but part of the implementation is helping you develop recruiting <coughs> techniques and, and materials. So let me just make sure, like, let, let's say we do the minimum. I, I only say minimum because we were able to recruit about 30 
So that would be roughly 20,000 that we have to have no matter what, correct? Yeah, correct. And then if we have, and that's including <coughs> students that would be full-time cyber? Full-time cyber, part-time. Okay, so what about this 325 per semester? That would be if we would teach them. That does not count towards your user That's just oh, well, cost per, okay. again, blended schools, certified okay. teachers provide so our teachers would provide it? Up the top the part. Top the bottom part is just basically a cost per enrollment. Okay. You know, so for example, Penn Arjo uses us for the providing Mandarin Chinese, mm -hmm. I think, and Japanese to them. Right. And they just enroll into our language. That would be the 325 or 475. The 475. Um, one, one little caveat here. Um, we only provide our languages, Mandarin Chinese, Russian, Japanese, uh, Arabic, and so forth. We only provide those in the full synchronous model because of what research shows. You have to have the interaction. But all the other curriculum we provide that's non-language, you can get in the limited synchronous model. If our teachers are not prepared yet to teach these online courses, do we still need to pay that nope. user membership? Nope. Okay. You can just enroll them right into our languages, too. But to really get your teachers trained and ready to go, at some point in time, you're going to have to get them in the system right. and train them uh, to do the things they need to do. Questions? Anything else? Good questions. Okay. I'll send the PowerPoint then to um, yeah. And y'all and then yeah, we can go ahead and Angela. Okay. Yeah. On Thursday. Yeah. I'll email you tomorrow and then we'll send it. Angela, I do have a question for you. Do we have teachers ready to go? No. Not yet. Not at all. No. I mean, because I know I do a lot of online classes. Oh, do you? Yeah. <coughs> do not, yeah. not, yeah. not yeah. 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 Training yeah. is critical. Yeah. Because yeah. the success of a student yeah. isn't related to the content yeah. or technology yeah. related yeah. to yeah. the instruction. Yeah. No I different regular classes. Yeah. 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 Do you have a question? Did you have a question? I'm sorry. No, no, no. no. Oh, okay. All right. So, I've read a lot of these stories. Okay. Thank you. Thank you
and in, in a context of a great need for districts to compete with cyber charter schools. So uh, we, uh, we started the company in 2007 officially, and, and uh, we've been refining and polishing what we do ever since. Um, okay. so, uh, what we do is we, uh, we call our model the holistic model of learning. Uh, in order to make things work, uh, what we do is ultimately uh, provide everything that a district would need to compete with a cyber charter school, but, but ultimately that, that lends itself to a lot of other applications that um, become very uh, useful and practical. Um, our first product line that we, uh, we started in, in, in the refinery at the time was called Cyber School in Box. It's a turnkey cyber school solution. It includes everything that a student would need uh, that, uh, that who's shown an interest in enrolling in a cyber charter school or a full-time home-based alternative. And, and so um, it includes uh, hardware, uh, printer scanner, textbooks, tech support, uh, everything that it can, can possibly need uh, to express that interest. Um, and uh, the, the, the key thing, though, I think that really is at the heart of our breakthrough is, uh, is this idea of putting lessons online that match the scope and the sequence of the lessons presented in your, your home district's classrooms. Students can move in and out of the programs that we work with you to, to create and stay on track. Um, uh, it becomes very powerful uh, in, in a lot of different environments um, because uh, students just simply migrate in and out of not only cyber schools sometimes, but in one of learning programs is another big uh, implementation that we have. We work with districts to set up on-campus audit programs. We work with summer schools. We have a lot of credit recovery, recovery implementations, all built upon our holistic model, all built upon this, this holistic platform that we, we own and, and ultimately we're not a value-added reseller. We, we own our learning management system. We provide all of the logistical support, all the instructional support if you so desire to use that. And, um, and we have a, 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 a good uh, success rate of implementing our program in the uh, district throughout the state. So uh, the other big thing I think that we offer is this idea of, uh, of publishing tools, content libraries, and support and consulting services. Um, the, one of the challenges that we saw when we started this, this program or this company um, was that a lot of the, the learning management systems were really designed, that were in place, were really designed for higher ed. What we needed to have was somebody had to come up with uh, not only a delivery platform, but also an authoring tool that allowed public schools to maintain their identity in their online environment. We're not serving a, a, a pre-made curriculum online um, exclusively. We, we can build those courses in a way that, uh, that nobody else has really ever done before. Um, so. So this is all against the backdrop of, of cyber charter schools, and uh, and like I said, we uh, we came up with this uh, this breakthrough. We call it a uh, learning object based instruction, um, and and we started offering this cyber school to box statewide. As you know, in Pennsylvania, cyber charter schools have been growing greatly, and, and districts need a response. So since they started, it's cost the the, the state uh, two uh, over two billion dollars, and it's grown. Uh, Standard. And here, uh, you know, specifically at Easton, um, this last year you had 148 students out uh, in cyber charter schools, and that cost the district 1.7 million dollars. And since inception, uh, it, it's cost the district uh, 7.5 million dollars. Um, so, um, what you need, and, and districts across Pennsylvania need, is a way, is a proven alternative to cyber charter schools. Uh, that allows you to prevent students from enrolling in cyber charter schools. A student comes into your guidance department and says, I'm going to PA virtual. Uh, what we offer is a, a turnkey solution that you can offer that student. They take that cyber school in a box, it's actually a physical box, they take it home, they plug it into their, their internet connection at home, and, uh, and they, uh, they interact with the teacher live, uh, real time. We have uh, synchronous instruction every day. We have highly qualified teachers that support all of the courses that we offer. We provide our PIMS numbers. 
we have over the years, and especially here, it's pointed, we've come up with a way to work with districts to allow your teachers to provide all of the instructional support. We've, we've scaled our service options to be technology only, uh, technology and grading, and technology and full instructional support. And uh, it's, we've really come to a point of being ultimately the most flexible solution that's available. It's still built upon a solid foundation, a solid framework of support in, in technology. Um, so another thing that we found is that districts need a way to recover students who are in cyber charter schools. I live in Pittsburgh, I drive by uh, numerous billboards on the way to work every day for cyber charter schools. So in order to help districts you know, move into that realm, we thought we'd just go all in and offer uh, sales and marketing support. As you'll see in your packets, we've done some customized marketing already for Easton, and there are some handouts there that we, um, we would happily you know, reintroduce into your program. Um, another key thing is you know, influencing the quality and rigor of instruction. We're proud of our assessment strategy. I'll, I'll go to the last, it's kind of one of the same two points, where um, a lot of times along my learning, there's an, almost an over-reliance on multiple choice questions in the form of assessment. So what we've done is we've come up with uh, an authentic assessment strategy that ultimately relies on students showing their work by handwriting examples and scanning the, the, the results of their example, of uh, their work into the system and then our teachers actually grade, they, they, they view those artifacts and write their comments on those artifacts. If you think about something like math, where students are in your bricks and mortar classroom, uh, there's a, a, big, um, a big emphasis on showing your work. Well, it only makes sense that that would translate into the online environment. Now to do that, in theory, is you know, a pretty good idea, but to actually carry it off in the delivery system with the support and the, and the mechanism behind the back end support um, it's really a big deal. We're very proud of that. We think that's revolutionary in the field of online learning to make that happen. Um, and then, you know, we, we started out really as a, as a full time cyber school alter, alternative to cyber <coughs> schools. And as we grew, more and more districts said, we want to use this in blended learning programs, we want to use it in all and we want to use it in credit recovery, summer school, you name it. And so, over the years, we've established and maintained all these programs and we are tried and true, polished it over for many years. I'm not going as fast as I hope, so sorry if I gave one with it. Um, I'd like to be able to, to skip a few slides. I, I, I think, you know, for this, this, the point of this slide is that um, in order to have a successful program, there really are uh, three points of emphasis, but they, they have to all be delivered in equal measure. Um, you could have a great delivery platform uh, and, and not really have instructional content, or, or you know, and, and the, the program is somehow lacking it. But sometimes we say it's a lot like baking cake. In order to have a successful program, you need to have this, this interaction of support, the content, and delivery tools. And, um, and, and really, the way we do content is, is new and, and really exciting, I think, in that we use both commercial and proprietary content that we build in-house, and, uh, and we deliver it all in one overall package. Um, so, so our solution is the Eastern Virtual Academy. Um, uh, key points are we'll make it work, and we'll show you how to run it. Um, we have districts in the area that have started out with full support from their teachers. They, they use our technology support and our, uh, our logistics support and our, and, our, uh, and our content, and their teachers do all the live instruction. We have other districts that use our teachers that they need. Um, it's really entirely up to you. Key point is your lessons online. Scope and sequence is really the buzzword that we hang our hat on. We think we're the first people to ever do it to do it well. And, uh, and boy, you know, it gets into making these online learning programs work. There just are a lot of different logistical details. We, we handle it all. Notebook computers, textbooks, supporting materials, tech support, live teacher support. It's all, it's what we do. And, um, 
lot of our teachers, and, and really, <coughs> as you know, uh, uh, when students uh, graduate from the programs that we support, they receive your diploma, they receive your curriculum, and they have access to your resources. And uh, the line that we, we often mention here is that um, if, if students are going to be graduating from your virtual academy, it only makes sense, and, and you're offering your diploma, it only makes sense that they're taking your courses. And that's really a key differentiating factor that our model offers is that we can put lessons online and that's what's happening in your classrooms. And um, so uh, that's a big deal. And you know, the, the sales and marketing is also something that we uh, we are proud to, to offer. We, uh, we have people, and I think we might have actually done this uh, here, and the reason certainly uh, where we'll, we'll do a direct outreach to your families that are in cyber charter school <coughs> and invite them to come in to a parent information meeting and, uh, and we'll explain the program. Of course, it's not the LN that we offer, it's who we represent you in terms of uh, sales and marketing. And, uh, but we do uh, <coughs> online, uh, we do Facebook ads and, and we do whole campaigns that are all geared towards driving students back in your district. Um, this is what we call the Jeopardy slide. Ultimately, it's just a quick, uh, a quick overview of the, some of the programs that we do. And I think these are all uh, in, in place now. Uh, basically, we break our offerings into two categories. There's off-campus programs where we offer cyber school in a, in, in a box. And then on-campus programs, which are um, really fun to, uh, to work with it and, and to devise over time. Our latest on-campus program that we're proud to offer is our project-based Keystone uh, prep assessment class, which isn't up there now. And, um, and you know, what, what basically, in, in any environment that, that you can use visual content in a, in a supported delivery environment, we've, we've, um, we've offered a program and they'll find it over time. Um, okay. So here are the specific areas of focus for, for you all. And basically, the, the, we offer a proven solution, and, uh, and it, it enables you to keep, compete with cyber charter schools. Um, we have a, a return on investment guarantee. There's an annual network membership fee that we, offer, that we charge, and uh, what we do is we'll uh, We'll measure your, your current expense to cyber charter schools. And uh, if you don't make back at least the amount that you pay in your annual fee, we'll waive that in subsequent years. So what we, we do is we say, it's all part of our overall partnership concept where um, we'll, we'll charge you for our initial set of services and our, and our initial annual services. And if we don't prove that that comes from the savings you realize from cyber charters, we won't, we won't charge that in, in subsequent years. Um, we offer, uh, uh, East, and this is a key point, is a you know, flexible product and service bundle enables your teachers to take over instruction <coughs> at any time. Um, there are districts in the region, like I said, that have come to their teachers out of the gate. Some, some districts use our teachers to do grading and their teachers to do live synchronous support. In other districts, our teachers are doing all of the synchronous support and their teachers are involved in the curriculum planning process. It's entirely up to you. Um, and a fully supported cost-effective solution with no hidden fees or additional expenses is a, is a key thing. We try to make it very simple, very clean, very pragmatic in terms of the way we offer our solution. And um, this next point is a big deal, and it's, it's very at the end of the presentation, and uh, probably if, if anybody's still with me. The, uh, the single sign-on delivery platform is really a, a big deal. We don't, we own our learning management system, and we have programmers on staff, and we, uh, it allows us to do things that are uh, just, just, un, they're just unavailable on other delivery platforms. Like for instance, we use PowerSchool, and, and so our teachers, when we enter uh, grades into PowerSchool, and I understand you use PowerSchool here, they can be automatically migrated in and out of your gradebook. But not only that, but we have a, a reporting mechanism and we've done custom programming that allows to, us to take your PowerSchool data to another level of graphic uh, 
the representation that simply is uh, just unavailable with the platforms. So we're, we're in at the code. Not only that, we offer the content as well. So it's uh, we, we really we offer this in a way that it's just it's not a patchwork of different technologies. It's all in this one seamless, holistic user interface. And um, another thing that we've uh, we've learned and refined over time is uh, we have a, we've done a lot of business in the area. We have a lot of uh, loyal uh, customers that have been with us for a while, and and we we recognize a, a, a strong need for a demand for our clients to interact with each other. So a few years ago, we formed the Eastern PA Cyber Consortium, and it's based in partnership with the IU20. We work with them <coughs> constantly, and we have. Well, uh, Renee's here, this is Renee Harris from IB20, and she'll explain the, uh, the benefits that that consortium offers. Good evening, everybody. Uh, it's getting later, so I'm getting more energized, so I'll apologize already. Um, I did do one little slide so you could see it. Uh, I could probably talk your ear off for a long time, but I won't do that. Um, it'll come up. Anyway, uh, over the last several years, um, as an IU, we've seen lots of programs and we've had the ability to take a look at different management systems, um, playing with different things, and we really were able to develop a fantastic partnership with uh, where we are able to have a virtual school consortium and bring all our districts that are using VLI together to work together, to network, and really create programs that would benefit our schools and our districts. Um, yeah, that's good. Coming up. <coughs> anyway, uh, so one thing that we do have through our consortium, we already have um, an established partnership with VLN. Um, we have regularly scheduled meetings where we bring together uh, all of our districts and we um, work together to try and create a regionalized approach. So instead of each school doing something in isolation, we try and bring everybody together and pull those resources, which makes sense. We want to pull everybody's great thoughts together, pull the brainstorming together, and create the best programs with that shared knowledge. So that's really what we do. I put a bunch of things up on this screen. They're just basic big topics of items, and I could talk about all of you for a long time, but I won't do that. Um, so we're trying to consolidate those resources, bring everyone together, professional development, creation of handbooks, some people we've been talking about in our meetings, developing contracts for students, trying to get the best ideas to <coughs> get a commitment from those students and parents and make a successful program. Um, offering that professional development at the IU, we have all sorts of resources. I'm available to you as well. Um, as part of our consortium to come out, I can train your teachers, work with everybody, work with your administrators, all of those pieces um, to make sure what we want is to have successful programs in our school. We want you to succeed, we want your students to succeed. And so that's some of the things that we do in the consortium. Um, we have a lot of people that share their programming um, from their perspectives, which is, is really helpful because everybody always wants to know what everyone else is doing. Um, and then they take different pieces and ideas that will fit their programs. Uh, another thing that we've been talking about is taking a look at research and data analysis. How are our students doing? That was one of the last big topics. Our students are in cyber programs. How are they actually doing? Um, so that's another thing we're taking a look at as a group. Developing a survey to go out to all of those cyber charter students, not asking why they left, but why are you staying now? Because we want you back. So as a big group, we're doing that together, um, which is very insightful because everybody has a little bit of something to add. So um, the consortium provides all sorts of things. We're continuing to grow. We're continuing to morph what are based off of what our districts need. Um, so that's a couple of things. Um, I'm available anytime. I'm at the IU, so if anybody ever wants to ask me any questions or talk to me, uh, just give me a call. Um, anyway, and we are here to help you so you're not alone. 
um, and that's part of that. We want to help with your program implementation and support you um, through our consortium and our partnership. So that's just a little tidbit. Um, thank you. Appreciate it. Mm -hmm. And that, that professional development is really key. Especially as we uh, develop more and more offering tools and technology stuff on the platform, it makes sense to have a good solid relationship with them and to provide as much information uh, as, as we can. And that really is bundled into all of the packages that we offer. So, and this is the pricing slide. Of course, this will be provided in <coughs> detail if you like. And, um, and our prices have you know, remained ultimately cons down the years. Um, we have an annual fee with a return on investment guarantee. And then what that includes is free customization services for 10 courses per year. So that means our team of course developers will work with your curriculum departments and put 10 courses a year online and match the scope of the sequence which that in the classrooms. We also have, uh, it, we offer this, uh, this new uh, Incentive where it's essentially free you know, district wide routes. We offer free, 50 free logins, and that's something we can do now that we have our delivery platform. So for those. And then um, there's professional development, sales, and marketing, and other things like that. For Cyber School in a Box, we scale down our pricing based upon the amount of full time instructional support that we offer for our teachers. For district supported program, it's $2,500. On all the technology and logistic, logistic support and professional development. And your, that means your teachers are doing the live instruction and the grading. If you want us to do the grading only, that's $3,500 per student. And the, the full support from our teachers and staff is $4,500 per student. Then we get into blended logins. There's a pricing for those that the full credit blended logins is $650 per student per course. Again, that's if you would like to use our lab for some strange reason. Um, and uh, half credit in summer school is 250 per course. Let me get into district-wide logins, and there's a volume discounts that are going across the board. Um, we, we believe that our platform is ultimately uh, filling a great need for a combination of delivery platforming and instructional content. And those district-wide logins are, uh, well, it, it's something that we're, we're proud to offer. With you to implement that here if you'd like. So, just to wrap up the pricing in terms of the nuts and bolts, a full time cyber option uh, for every student that would enroll in our cyber squad and box program, which would ultimately be the East and West Virtual mm -hmm. Academy, um, with the, the full support option, the savings would be $5,300 per student. Partial support, $6,300, and, and full support from your teachers, you'd be saving $7,300 per student. Uh, and that's for regular ed kids, special ed, the savings are, are much greater. Um, and ultimately, uh, we, uh, we, we take great pride in our programs and the support that we offer. And uh, we've, I'd like to say we're pioneers in, in, in the realm, and, and we, have, uh, we have been flexible and adapted and, and really refined what we do in a way that I'm, I'm happy to say that uh, I, I think is the best option uh, by far available today. So I think that's it. Any, are there any questions? Yeah, I'm interested in one thing. You mentioned uh, your analysis and everything that you've done. Uh, and why do students stay out of school? We haven't done it yet. We're in the process of um, working with the districts to develop a survey to be able to send out with all of them. So that we can take a look as to the reason why they stay out and get some first-hand knowledge from our region students, you know, not necessarily across the state, but I'll let you know as soon as we have information. And Alex, have you done any of that type of analysis, or you seen it, or what have you heard as to why you're going into schools that the students are out? The the reasons are are are, are as varied as as you can imagine. I think that. Um, in, in many districts um, that we work with, uh, there's a, a large homeschool population where, where students are motivated by just a difference in opinion about the curricular options. Um, and in other districts, there's a 
you know, more moving towards inner city environments, there's there's uh, some concern about bullying and, and other reasons. Um, and, and those are the, the, the ones that they're, they're really, they're just hard to pull back. The, the ones, some, some families are just simply entrenched. But other ones are, have just, uh, they have this idea that, that cyber school is, is easier and maybe the, they're just not as academically inclined or, uh, or maybe there's uh, simply just some, some particular <coughs> incident that the district would, would cause them to leave. And they're actually very, we find, easy to, to pull back into the history. Ultimately, you have it. Your diploma and your resources are enormous draws for, for students. Um, and uh, when, when students get to cyber charter schools and families get involved in that environment sometimes, a less rigorous environment, they, uh, I think a lot, of, a, a lot of their preconceived notions are demystified pretty, pretty quickly. So, uh, what was that a good example? You put it funny. It's complicated. Any other questions? You said you, you uh, what, you developed or you opened your LMS system? Can you elaborate slightly more on that? Because I thought I'd seen something in some of the literature about using, that you do use Blackboard as well. Oh, which is we, we use the, the Blackboard Collaborate video conference. Okay, 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 that's what I'm saying. That's certainly the thing. Okay, so you, you have that that's, and, and you license that or whatever it is. Right. Okay. That's a delivery. Okay, okay. I just, okay, I didn't see that somewhere. Okay, so it was just for the collaborating. Uh, okay. And the LMS you would be developing. Uh, the other thing you mentioned, maybe I, maybe I missed it, you said something about the, uh, your analogy was they, uh, they go home, they uh, plug it in, turn it on. So, you know, you're talking about your turn. Are you talking about a, you have a specific software type package that they install on a whole computer that enables no, that's what it sounded like to me, but maybe yeah. I missed something. We provide the computer. Oh the computer. Okay. It, it, okay. It is locked down okay, the that's what I was instructions. Okay. I think I missed something on that. There's also a printer scanner that comes there. Okay, so that's so that's gonna be properly configured and but it, it, it's important to note that the, 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 it's a prerequisite for the families to have internet connectivity. Yeah. Yeah. I knew I had missed a part of that when you had said that. I didn't know what you were referring to. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate it. course of this year that full day kindergarten is a priority that this administration holds and I know that the board holds as well. So the administration has come together and put forth a proposal for us to be able to provide full day kindergarten in three of our elementary schools beginning in the 15-16 school year. The three elementary schools that we are suggesting, suggesting are Paxinosa, Cheston, and March. Those are our three Title I schools. So that is why the recommendation is coming forward is for those three schools to start. Um, in your packets this Friday, you received a memo from me that outlines 
the, uh, the potential funding sources that we would use in order to uh, pay for full day kindergarten at these three schools. At this point, it is a moving target because without having the governor's budget, we are not able to really say to you this evening that we would use these dollars versus another. Uh, but we are able to say to you that we have three scenarios that we would use to cover the additional 5.5 teachers that it would uh, take for us to be able to implement the full day kindergarten at those three schools. I outlined those three different potential uh, scenarios for you in the briefing, looking at Title I dollars, looking at Ready to Learn dollars, or looking at utilizing existing staff within our districts to reallocate and be able to staff those positions in that fashion. And again, that will all be dependent upon what the dollars look like when we receive the budget um, and when we receive the, the no to be the allocation that's in those two specific grants. So without having the funding, I'm really just coming to you this evening to be able to request your permission to move this on to the full board for us to be able to start advertising and start the process for offering full day kindergarten at those three schools beginning next school year. We know when the governor puts together the budget chance. I don't know. <laughs> that is um, you, you hope it's not it coming in, out tomorrow. No. <laughs> you hope to have it in the spring. Okay. But um, you know, he has until June thirtieth. Okay. okay. But that, also yeah, could like go the beyond part, that. Like, what was the requirement um, for the governor? But even so, I know last year with uh, Ready to Learn dollars, we learned in about July or August that we were receiving above and beyond what the original allocation was. So again, you know, we won't know specifically until potentially August exactly what we receive. We're going to have to make decisions before then as to what, what we're doing as far as where we're using, what, what, what dollars or funding stream we're using. But um, I think by, you know, by June we'd be confident in order to be able to say one thing or another. So um, your, your projection had to all three bases covered yes, really we did. there would be no additional correct. cost. That's correct. Mm -hmm. And we are confident that this is sustainable. One thing that we've met a number of times now and been able to discuss as a group is a number of years ago, a few years back, we had full day kindergarten at Cheston and we had to um, eliminate that as part of the budget process. This is something that this administration believes in. We're committed to. This is probably our top priority as an administration is the early learning years and preparing students for, um, for their time in school. So we are able to come to you today and tell you that this is a sustainable option, no matter which scenario we go through. It's another perfect example of how the uh, system of funding schools in Pennsylvania <coughs> fails kids and it fails taxpayers. Simply put, I mean, we're waiting for a uh, new budget. It will probably uh, come out sometime in March, I would think. Uh, you know, our guess is, um, and then <coughs> the debate begins, and we really. Uh, it puts us in a, in all districts in a, uh, or not just districts, uh, all, all uh, human services and county governments and municipalities, it puts everyone in an awkward position because you may want to uh, be able to do something um, to expand your services or to better, uh, allocate your resources and you really can't plan on it until you know what uh, what's coming. It's a uh, very sad set of circumstances. In this case, they were pretty, but uh, a little bit more fortunate to have like options where we, we don't have to spend on it. Yes. If it doesn't come. Yes. Right. So that, that we're, we're operating in, uh, with everything that we're not getting any more money. So, uh, you know, we just feel that's the safest thing to do. Can you already want to agree? We also know through our enrollment study that our enrollment is decreasing, or it's declining year to year. So that's something that we've taken into account as well. And this is something you'd like to bring up next Tuesday. It is, yes. I would, yeah, I would ask that this be moved to um, for a vote next Tuesday. And what that'll do is give us an opportunity to start planning more specifically and, and getting things going for the programs at those three 
Regents. And hopefully we'll see it expanding to our other schools. Is so that, that your goal? Have, yes. Our yeah, goal is obviously for us to implement in all seven of our schools, right. but we're looking to scale up to, to be able to fund that. Ultimately. All right, the next item I have is uh, the before and after care provider. You know, throughout this school year, we've, um, we've gotten to a point finally where I'm able to come to you with a provider. Um, the RFPs that I received, they were submitted to me January, by January 9th of this year. I received a few RFPs from different providers, and we held an interview process for those providers on January 28th. Myself, Mr. Reinhardt, Mr. Hightower, the principal at Tracy Elementary School, and um, Mrs. Galloway, the principal at Shawnee Elementary School, sat on the interview panel. And the four of us interviewed the providers and were able to come to a unanimous recommendation for uh, Lehigh Valley Children's Center to be the provider here in Easton at all seven of our elementary schools beginning next school year. Uh, LVC LBCC comes to us with a great deal of experience across the valley in a number of different school districts, including our own. They are the provider currently at Forks Elementary School. We do have one school that does have before and after care, and at Forks, LBCC is the provider. So not only have we received uh, letters of support from various districts, but we also have firsthand knowledge of their abilities to be able to run a seamless program. Another thing that tr attracted us to LBCC was uh, that they provided last year alone uh, $132,000 in scholarship assistance to local families across the valley, not just here in Easton, but across the valley for those families that were not able to qualify for Title 20 or were on the waiting list for Title 20, uh, but still needed daycare for their children. So they're committed to serving all families, and that was something that was very attractive to us. Uh, they also are able to utilize and, and leverage different partnerships through a number of different grants that they are able to bring in additional partners such as the Da Vinci Science Center, the Lehigh Valley Zoo, um, and a number of different other providers, and that's at no cost to the parents. So that is something that they're bringing in that our students would then have available to them in those hours, but at no additional cost. And LBCC, again, like I said, they have a reputation as a provider that is able to run a seamless program in those before and after care hours. Um, another thing that was very attractive to us, and we did not include in our original RFP, that they, but they did come back to the table that they are able to offer, is at the four other elementary schools where we're not proposing full day kindergarten, they would be able to offer a half day K at, the cost, of, uh, at cost to families but the half day care for students that are in either AM or PM kindergarten. So creating a type of hybrid full day kindergarten at our other four, four locations until we're able to get full day kindergarten in all four of those sites. <coughs> so that was something that was extremely attractive to us as a panel. So I'm coming to you this evening uh, asking that we be able to move Lehigh Valley Children's Center to the full board for a vote next week. I did also include in your packets the sample agreement that Mr. Freund's office was able to review as well. So if there were any additions or um, suggestions on that before I present that to LBCC, um, those would be welcome. Any how, many, how many dollars did they provide to the families in our area? And what are the costs that they actually charge the parents? Do you know? Yes, they do. I don't know the dollars specific to Easton. I just know that 132000 was across the Lehigh Valley. Um, but the dollars that they would charge our families would be... I mean, I think because of some of the information we're looking at, it would be nice to know how much did they supply to our families. Sure. Yeah, the fee structure is um, it is included in the packet, but the weekly full time that would be for both AM and PM was ninety eight dollars. AM only every day of the week would be fifty six dollars. PM only every day of the week would be sixty one dollars. These are all very reasonable um, in comparison to other vendors. In the, um, 
And then they also have flexible daily drop-in care. So if a family needed care on a given day and they weren't signed up to receive care all every day, they're able to drop their child off and that is $21 in the morning or $23 in the, uh, in the afternoon. job with this and leading the effort and coordinating this and um, I suspect we're going to have lots of um, families who are going to be very happy with this uh, service available so uh, it's a good thing. Well, um, any questions from who's ever left? <laughs> 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 okay, well, that's good The subcommittee will meet on Thursday for the cyber school to make a recommendation and then will be brought up for a vote next week at the board meeting. Also, um, we'll be um, asking to vote uh, about the full day kindergarten proposal. And um, we were given an update about before and after school um, child care and we'd like to see about a vote on next week where we have Valley um, Children's Center, or LBCC, to, um, uh, next week also. So we have a lot of votes next week to take. And that's it. Hey, thank you. Moving on to policy, Mr. Snyder. Thank you, now we get into real exciting stuff. Uh, <laughs> policy, uh, Mr. Castrovici, please. I'm sure this presentation will drive the two of you away. You should have in front of you policies 339 and 439. Um, they may look vaguely familiar because last year you approved policy 539 for um, support staff. So basically all this is is we're bringing back the same policies that apply to administrative <coughs> employees under 339 and professional employees, teachers, under 439. Uh, the changes are all identical to 539, which is in effect at this point, but I will go over them uh, quickly. On page one of both policies under authority, we added a sentence that reads, <coughs> uncompensated leave shall be granted in accordance with the terms of an applicable compensation plan. And that's because in most of our collective bargaining agreements, there, there is language that talks about employees <coughs> taking uh, leaves of absence. Um, if you go down a little bit to the bottom of page one, under period of leave, we did uh, tie SSLA to the one year um, uh, period that an employee can be off, so you can't take one year uncompensated leave and then 12 more weeks of FMLA. Uh, it's one year total, and that's, we're always advised by John Freund's office to run FMLA that way, to run it concurrently with the leave of absence. On page two at the top, there's a sentence that talks, that basically gives the administration more latitude when an employee returns to service from a leave of absence where they are placed. Uh, normally, employees are placed, especially teachers, they're placed back, you know, where they're <coughs> teaching. It's not that we're looking to, to move people all over the place, but if we, you know, if the occasion would um, arise and there's a need to move someone, we would be allowed to do that. And then under enforcement, and this is something that I've been monitoring closely and working with employees, uh, when an employee's absenteeism exceeds the employee's leave entitlement, the employee shall be subject to discipline up to and including termination from employment. And you know we've had to take that route um, with several employees um, that just can't seem to you know find find it in themselves to get to work on a regular basis, and they're never you know um, pleasant meetings. But uh, you know we do try to get the point home that you know the kids have one shot at education. They need their teachers here. They need their principals here. They need their support staff here. And so it is important to uh, come to work as often as possible. Any questions on either policy? Thank you. No, no thank you. <coughs> um, that's it. 
I did provide um, a justification, a short brief justification, just so you understand why we are looking to go back to um, the graduation requirement policy from 2013. It was actually, if you look through, let me go, why don't I go through the actual policy? If you go to the second page, um, I think it's on the back of the first page, it's like the same page right here. We're looking at taking away the four units of math and science. Currently, we are in that state right now. We have, we require our students um, three units of math and science, and three, uh, three units of math and science, period. Um, and previously in 2013, it was changed to four <coughs> units of math and science. Our students are not going to suffer at all um, by doing this and going back to what we previously had. In fact, if you look at my justification sheet, I looked at the numbers, and the class, the current class that is graduating this year is actually, if you look down towards the bottom of the page, we have almost 80% of our seniors taking a fourth year of science already. And almost approximately 82% of our senior class is taking a fourth year of math. And that's not because they're required, they do that. Our students in Easton actually do take a fourth, fourth year of math and science. Um, and <coughs> if we go, if we continue with the policy the way it is, knowing that we want full day kindergarten, it will cost us, when we look at our numbers for the junior class, which this is gonna be required for next year if this policy doesn't change, we would have to add an additional one and a half math teachers and an additional science teacher. Um, at a cost of $250,000. That doesn't include our students who would fail uh, math or science their ju uh, junior year going into their senior year. It may increase. So we as a central office committee in the administration would like to present that we go back to the original policy, which is um, in the guidelines of chapter four regulations. We need all the guidelines. Uh, and we're asking to go back to the three units of math. Were there other subjects that could be cut instead of math and science? Well, I, I was going to ask, because I didn't sure. grow up in the Commonwealth, right? Sure. And, but I do remember that when I was in high school, I had a half a year of health, a half a year of phys ed, mm -hmm. not okay. two years of phys ed, and half a year of health, as shown in the year. So right. I'm wondering, is that a Commonwealth requirement, or? The, well, the, the whole idea, just seeing with nutritional guidelines and being healthy, is to have students in physical activity on a yearly basis. Mm -hmm. And so how that's done could differ from district to district. Uh, as far as credit units are required, under Chapter 4, there aren't credit units. So in the Commonwealth, as you mentioned, it doesn't say you need four units of this, three units of that, three units of that. What it says is, you have several standards underneath science, you have several standards underneath PE, health, and safety, those standards that you're referring to, uh, and your students have to be able to master those to a certain extent and level. And so our curriculum at the high school level, and actually seven through 12 for chapter four, then articulates those activities. And so when you look at grade nine PE, grade 10 PE, grade 11 PE, grade 12 PE, those units of instruction within those four realms for our students are articulated 9 through 12. So in 10th grade, there's a fitness component. Uh, in 10th grade, there's also a health component. And so what, the, what those encompass is meeting those standards under Chapter 4 regulations. Uh, across the way, Wilson High School can determine that they're going to give kids at gym on Mondays. They're going to give kids health on Tuesdays. They're, only, they're going to do health in, in 10th grade and 12th grade. They're going to do health in 9th grade or 11th grade. It's, a, it's an LEA decision to determine when and when, how they offer those. Here, what we've decided to do, as long as I've been around and as long as the school district has been around, is that we want students in physical activity on a yearly basis. Uh, and right now that students have PE for a semester every other day, so it's 45 days at 78 minutes of physical activity. And that's each um, year, every year. That's each year, that's correct. Uh, we do have students have to double up. And they, in fact, fail a course. Uh, for example, um, but they right now with the staffing that we have, students also can't increase uh, that elective either because we don't simply have enough staff members um, to be able to do that. So I hope that answers that question. I think the other question was about 
uh, changing other offerings, correct, Mr. Van? Right, in which has three, any of the others. And as, as Mrs. DeVitro mentioned before, and, and the Central Administrative Team reviewed this very closely as well, is that by going to four units of math and four years of science, that we actually restrict students from taking other coursework. For example, two units of science in their senior year versus two units, one unit of math and one unit of science. So it's actually a disadvantage to our students to require them to have to do the math and the science if in fact they wanted to take two math or two sciences. Some of our students are completing calculus in 11th grade. So in 12th grade, there really isn't a need to, to be able to do that to take another math course. They could take AP Physics, they could take AP Chemistry, they could take Anatomy and Physiology. So depending on what they have, we want to let them have those offerings available to them that better articulate what they're going to be doing post-secondary. Um, and by having them do four and four, it actually restricts some of those students. Uh, the other factor is that when we have that four-year requirement, the students that that may hinder, and the number isn't tremendous, um, but the, the students that it will hinder, ironically, you got a presentation from Current Tech Ed today, uh, students have, would then have to take four core over the course of four years, now, right, that's the only place that those kids have some flexibility their senior year to take a science they may have missed, to take a math course they may have missed, and now what would happen is then they're going to start to lose that career and tech time to take that other coursework. And in some cases, they may elect to drop out of their career and tech work after two years of committal to then take that coursework they need for graduation. Um, and so that, that's a negative impact on that group. So you're really looking at two ranges of students that are somewhat negatively impacted by this. Um, I don't think anyone wants to bring down the, you know, the core requirement, so to speak, that was recommended. But here, we're creating an inflexible structure, and it's also going to be at a cost to the district that I don't think right now we're willing to bear. But to go back, so we could we reduce English to three units as well, which then gives them more opportunity for electives. We, 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 Ms. yeah, Mr. Fanner, we can look at that program of study in general altogether. I would recommend if we were able, if we were to do that, that we do it on a much larger scale and looking at the whole program of study. And I'll be honest with you, as the principal, one of the difficulties, and, and Ms. Amelia and, and, and Ms. DeVitro can attest to this, is that we haven't really revised our program of studies over the last couple of years because we've looked at budgetary constraints. And so we really haven't had an opportunity to sit down and say, what would be the best pathway where what we looked at before was, look, STEM is in front of us. What are we doing for math and science? Let's do this increase. And we really did look at the program of studies as a whole, Mr. Phelan, to give those sort of opportunities to report. Right, now we're doing the same thing in reverse again. We're, we're not, again, looking at the whole thing. We're just taking a shot at it here. And the reason I start to ask more and more questions about sure. this, as you sit with more and more groups across this region and everything, there is a lot of talk about the math and the sciences. Mm -hmm. And so here that we're going the opposite way, I mean, we even felt a little bit of that last week at the foundation meeting. And so to see that we're going the opposite way, it's like, hold it, what are we trying to find? What are we trying to do and everything? And we're pulling away from it. So before we rush into this, is this something we ought to take a full comprehensive look at and say, can we do something different with English? Can we do something different? with history and you know then talk about your math and your science as part of that whole program as compared to just jumping at this. Mr. Bain, it'll be my recommendation that we look at what the teacher is putting forward tonight with the three units of math and the three units of science going back to that but then starting a full pro a full program of study uh, review and then coming back to the board and, and looking at what we could put into this policy. But knowing that this is going to impact next year's graduating class, I think it would be prudent to make the first decision now and then come up with a follow-up decision. So we should have yeah. started looking sooner. Yeah. Is also, are we also taking the funds from this to actually pay for the kindergarten, too? No, we are not. No, no we're not saving any money on this. But having an increase in cost would certainly have a, an impact on our there. ability to then fund that. Right. Now we, we were motivated partly by the um, partly by the requirement in the new policy, which uh, which impacts on classes. So we needed to take a look at that now because.
because uh, if, if we did, uh, we'd be uh, required to provide the right. form for and at the cost mentioned. So we felt it needed to come up now uh, because we just don't have, we don't have the funding for that. One of the other things is the graduation requirements under Chapter 4 are changing significantly for the sophomore class, uh, Mr. Payne. So that they'll have to pass three keys on examinations in order to graduate from high school. That has to be a, a strong, you know, discussion to have amongst the program of study folks. You know, how does that fit in there? Because there are some yeah. students who are going to need to take in 12th grade that fourth year, whether they are willing to participate in that or not in order to prove their proficiency in one of those three areas of algebra, biology, uh, and or English literature. So I think, um, you know, that that begs that, that sort of global perspective on a program of study review that must be done to make us be, uh, make us come in alignment with uh, the requirements for graduation by the state. And I think what, what Ms. Amelia is recommending is really important is that next year it impacts that group of 11th graders that are now going to 12th grade when we may rearrange that structure. And I don't think the new structure will necessarily include those four years. It may in fact eliminate <coughs> an English or go with four years of science or you know what I would say is just, just seeing it for the last eight years is to say students should be math or science, uh, not necessarily both. Um, and because <laughs> the reason why I say that is because I do know students who would rather take that additional AP science course than take another course in mathematics, like for example, Cal BC if they've had AP. Or now we have offerings for students for Cal 3. Um, AP physics is another one now that is now split into two, two algebra based physics courses and one calc-based physics course. I think you're going to see a whole lot of students, particularly at college prep and honors levels, wanting to take advantage of two additional AP physics courses that are now on the menu, so to speak, that weren't there in previous years. Um, so I think that's there's th those standards and some of the other changes that are being made uh, by the state that really begs us to get back together and look at the academic studies as a, as a whole. But we also could have looked at that too. Uh, the fourth year could have been either a math or a science. Correct. Right, and that would have satisfied just what you're talking Correct. about. Correct, and I think initially that was a topic of conversation that got lost in the shuffle, if I recall. Um, we looked at maybe keeping it the same, one or, one or the other, and then it ended up being both, I'll be honest with you. I think that's, those were the three conversations that I recall as having, uh, and in the end, um, you know, Support, this support, whatever happened. I mean, the reality is it's a policy now. Right. Um, but I would be much more in favor as a principal of one or the other because, like I said, it, right now it does provide a hindrance even for some of our top students to say, you have to do this when they've pretty much mastered their high school years of sciences, particularly if they want to go in the health fields. They don't need to take another calc class. They need to have any physiology. Right. What are the, I don't know it all, what are the, is there any uh, limit to the amount of courses in high school? Uh, well, technically, by year, they're limited to you know, there's eight, a physical eight, limitation, eight, but eight but units or so. Would so there be a way? Add 32 units. Yeah, because one of the reasons you had cited was they, they can't take something else because of whatever. Is there a way they can max out their daily schedule and then take a class in the cyber school on top of that? Or want to pursue something that's either an elective you, or something that will be an advanced? Or that's a whole other program of study uh, funnel of, of questions well, yeah, that, would, that would rein in from, from your decision next Wednesday right, about the side. Absolutely. That was one of the, the uh, options that we can provide our students to take additional courses. Somebody, yeah, school. somebody who's finishing Cal in yeah. 11th grade, I'm going to think, oh, wow, I guess that person is probably pretty motivated mm -hmm. sure. and yep. is mm -hmm. would like to enroll in the community college and take a course. You know, I've, I've had high school students right. in my courses. Or maybe take an online course uh, as a supplemental mm -hmm. through, even if it's a MOOC, even if it's a free online course. Those are those are people who usually, you know, do that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So, so you, we want to foster mm -hmm. those. And I agree with you. You, you. you seem to be in agreement. Mm -hmm. You want those students to be able to sure. pursue what they want right. and free up the scheduling to, to mm -hmm. focus on a schedule. They can focus. So those they go into college, they hit the ground running. They're they're ahead of their peers by two years. Most students don't know what they want to do in college. 
until their third year. So. We can just figure out the. <laughs> they don't. We can just figure out the cost. Yeah. Well, but that's always. Yeah. Then that, yeah, that's what happens. Is, is mom students. and dad stop signing the checks, or the funds run out? Yeah. So. Sure. Okay. All right. But just some idea. I'm thinking aloud, really, with that Absolutely. question. I, I know it's a whole other avenue. And, and that input to, would be greatly appreciated on the, on a group sitting around talking about a program yeah. study. Yeah. Does the state require us to label the courses math and science? So I'm thinking, why don't we just come up with all the STEM, and that was working back to your three and a half, three and a half. <coughs> I mean, maybe that would start, that would turn that would turn the market upside down. Yeah, yeah. But the state's going to be concerned about it, STEM. As long as you, as long as you, in a program of study, as long as you clearly delineate what what is required, what's not required, and then as. Mr. Cash, as you said, everything has to deal with certification errors. However, yeah, okay. we determine, you, the Board of Education determines what your local education associate, what your what your requirements are for graduation, as long as they meet the Chapter 4 regulations. And right now, Chapter 4 isn't going to say, you need to teach Earth-based science or you need to teach physical science in grade 9. They're not saying that. They're saying your kids better pass algebra, your kids better pass biology, and they better pass the literature test or they're not going to graduate. <coughs> That's what they're saying right now. And we also have to use our teachers who we have in place now for remediation courses and then on top of that, if they didn't pass the keystone, and use our resources to, to create the project-based assessment with our students. So there, the state is asking us to do a lot with our resources. And you know, my concern is to cut back on English or history or, you know, they, those teachers are the ones, it's not, they have to provide the remediation and the project-based assessment uh, tutorials for these, these students. So you don't have to have, like I can have a history teacher help out with an English uh, project-based assessment, but, you know, but it, it's it's tough right now with the, with the state of asking us. Yeah. And those kids, go ahead. So what Mr. Miller's saying is, when we go with the original proposal, mm -hmm. with, with the uh, stipulation that we're gonna take a look at the overall curriculum and then make adjustments from there, but we need to get part of this done now so that we can move into next year. That's That's right right here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think my disappointment ends up being, John, that you know this was the first time when it went in. <clears throat> this was probably about a year discussion or longer. And here we're making a decision in one week, basically, without other discussion going on ahead of time. It would have been nice to have six months discussion at least, or four months discussion minimally, uh, to cover this type of thing. Yeah. And now we're talking about graduation, we're talking, and here we're talking about the, the need for the remedial. You know, in a future one, it'd be nice to hear about all the remedial needs, how many students, how much we have to do, how many additional periods they require and everything, if that's where we're having to spend our needs, because, you know, is there a different way? In addition to that, just based on something uh, that Brian commented on too, Maybe we ought to look at a policy, if we can't offer it here, and we have students that want to take and they have, they've met basically the concept of our credits and everything, that uh, we will pay for them to go to the community college and take an extra course as well. You know, they want the extra science, they can't put it in the daytime now that we're not going to have it, then let us, you know, pick up that tab instead of the parents for them going out there and everything. <laughs> Uh, in addition to our share. So I think those are a couple more things that can be explored, and now we shouldn't lose them since this came up tonight. And, and I say that because I know that we also have programs where they can go to Lafayette, mm -hmm. uh, to Moravian, and do things, and that also helps the parents when they move forward to college. So I think there's a lot more to be explored here, and as I said, hitting on it on one night and expecting to vote next week is a little my, short. My expectation was not next week to vote on this. Right. I wanted to bring this up. I brought it up at the last academics and Ed committee meeting just to make you all aware um, because it is a concern for next year with, you know, everything going on. With it, uh, I think the difficulty with this was that it wasn't an administrative recommendation initially. Is that pretty much the way it was? Correct. I, I mean, I wasn't a part of the right, discussion. Right, right. But for those who are here, it wasn't an administrative recommendation. Uh, the board... Uh, at the time, I guess, felt, and I don't want to speak on behalf of, the, of those individuals because uh, they may have had uh, other reasons, but I guess it was to, to up the rigor of, of um, what, what we're doing. And like so many of those things, um, I'm not sure at the time that there was a 
conversation about the cost. And now we're, you know, we're sort of facing that. Um, and now we have to say, well, you know, how valuable is that? And as an administrative team, we're saying that uh, on the surface, it may look like it's upping the rigor, but in actuality and in practicality, it may be indeed um, uh, hurting some of the students that are more motivated to, uh, to take courses and, uh, and limiting them. So on the other side of it is the cost, the board of a million dollar cost. So uh, I don't know. That's one of the reasons why we're bringing it up now, uh, Bob, and uh, hoping that you know we can take a look at this and and make sure that we do something that's going to relieve us of that deadline. Well, John, I mean you have the cost issue, but at the same time, we kicked out a couple ideas here. Even when I said to him about uh, that fourth year could be an optional of either science or math, obviously that didn't even come into play before. I think we have another issue to deal also with, and that is what is happening in our technology area. I know we heard last week from uh, Mr. Cass about uh, the, the strong cutback in the teaching staff and everything and the loss of programs down there. Right. And, you know, we're not talking about that, but that probably ought to come up as well as an issue. And, you know, here we are tonight talking about technology, talking about new software and everything. We heard from the one student that came forward uh, about, you know, the benefits of it and everything, and we haven't even touched that. So I think there's a lot more to bring forward here now and, and to talk about, and this ends up only being a portion of it. You know, we're doing sure. it because of cost, sure. but you know, maybe there's a couple other ways of looking at this, and if you're not really looking for next week, how much can you put together before the next committee meeting? Yeah, I can certainly look at that, um, but with Mr. Cuck, um, I don't, you know, I could be stand correct, <coughs> but when this was, policy was brought up in 2013, actually a year before that, I don't think the Keystone exams were actually no. um, required. I don't, I know that project-based assessments were not required. I know that reme mandated remediation was not required. So my, our concern as a group was, what do you do with these teachers, make them teach these this fourth year math and science, but we can't, then that pulls them away from remediation and project-based assessment. And there is a lot to all of that. There really is. Um, and it, it, it is coming up very quickly, and you know, yeah. it's a concern. What, so can we get the whole picture? Sure. Well, Mr. Fanoff, if I could just chime in real quick. I think one of the other major factors here is that the reduction in staffing over the past four or five years um, doesn't allow you to do that forward thinking and plan effectively. And I think that's the reason why you know, it isn't a year of planning or isn't that because since that inception of that, even last year with the saving of jobs through retirement, the high school lost 9.5 staff members. That is a great impact on your ability to provide services or classes, coursework for students. So it's, you know, the crystal ball I wish we all had a couple years back to predict where we would be financially and staffing wise would have been great and I don't think we run into these issues. Unfortunately, when we lose those sort of staff members, things change, and that's why I strongly recommend we really take a close look at that program and study now that we've lost probably 38 to 45, 45 staff members in the last seven years since I've been at Eastern Aaron High School. Um, we've only lost 300 students. So that's a significant you know, changeover, and since then we've been Let's do a little bit here, let's do a little bit here, let's start a project, lead the way, as you just mentioned, Mr. Fainel. Uh, and you know that program is up and running and those software upgrades are gonna allow us to provide the full continuum of that coursework. However, those teachers are going to be very tight with their schedules and the number of students that are allowed to participate because we are limited in resources. And one of those tech ed teachers happens to be one of the 9.5 that was lost last school year. So, there's a lot of variables, I think, that get in the way of this idea that we're not planning. I think we are. I just think sometimes that plan is very static given the circumstances. So, you know, I do apologize if it feels, you know, like this is that way, but unfortunately, these are the situations that we're now in. And yeah. given those additional staff members, we could carry out what the board requested a couple years ago. It's just going to be at a cost to the district that we don't necessarily know we need to incur. So, thank you. All right, thank you. I just know the. Uh, the headline is going to read you seem to have stem no matter what. So, uh, <laughs> Which is not accurate it's at not all. It's not accurate. It doesn't matter, it's accurate. That's the point. Um, 
And one thing, I don't know who the webmaster is. There's, I'm looking here at the profile, trying to look up some things here. Of course, there's a mistake here. It says the, I don't know who does the website, but it says the East Area School District provides quality education for more than 92,300 students from four municipalities. So there's a number in there that is incorrect. So uh, whoever pass it on to whoever does the website, they can look at that. It's under the DHS profile. So. Not directly related to policy, but I saw it, so I'm going to mention it. Now, how soon would we have to vote on this for this to be effective? Um, scheduling is, is beginning at the high school, and I would say uh, like May. Well, given this conversation, all scheduling at the high school will be as the current policy is written. And then from there, we will look at staffing it at appropriately. And once <coughs> the decision has been made either way, then we will then make that adjustment um, at that point in time. But I mean, if the, if there, isn't there a certain yeah. timeline that we would need to know so we would know what, what An ideal situation so that we could proceed with scheduling, having some direction one way or another, would be that we move it forward next week. Next week. Should have been done in December. <clears throat> would have been even better. Well, I think we have to look at going forward now. You know, I, I can't yeah. agree with Bob. You know, it certainly would have been better to have a little more time. Yeah, but the thing is, that's not compounding the state. Or, you know, uh, by not voting on something that's going to make something better, you know, which, which I think, in, in the way you're explaining it, it does sound like it's going to be better for the students if we do this. Uh, the thing is, uh, like, like Bob said, you know, there, there's other things if we could take a look mm -hmm. at, you know, when we have some yeah. the, the, the time to do that, you know, maybe we could shift some mm -hmm. things around here too. Yeah, I think, yeah. I think the biggest better right now is that we're saving $250,000 out of the cost. That's, I mean, that's what was laid out right here in the middle. That is correct. Yeah, that's if it wasn't for that, this may not be quite the same issue. That, that's probably the reason why that that's is it. Yeah, but it okay. still costs less than a boobies bracelet. So. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it does. Yeah. It does a lot more good. Yeah. Science is a lot more good. Yeah. All right. Uh, any more questions? I got one. I got one. I got one. Yeah, please. And, and this kind of goes off what Mr. Puck said. Um, I guess what I got for, from that was we haven't actually sat down and put together what we want our curriculum to look like. Is kind of what I heard. Um, I don't know if it, I just drew a conclusion from that, but we haven't reviewed it in the last few years, other than just kind of changing the numbers two years ago. And I think we know what, it, what we want it to look like. With it, it's just mm -hmm. been we can't achieve that given the financial circumstances and the, the and district. So and there's two fit in curriculum and program of study are, are two different entities. The the curriculum would be the rate curriculum which students learn within a program of study. The program of study would be what you elect to do as a child or a student at Eastern High School to better prepare yourself either for the workforce or post-secondary ed. So the curriculum is there. It's what the child then chooses in that program of study, what pathway, what area of expertise, what area in which they want to study that needs to be better articulated and reviewed based upon the cutbacks and the things that have happened within our high school over the past four to five years. So the curriculum is there and the pathways are there for students. What needs to be revised is how we guide them through that process, so to speak. And, and, and I kind of think also what we want to get to ultimately, knowing that, that there have been changes in the last few years, where do we want to get to ultimately? And you know, last year in January, you sent us a letter that said, here's a five-year plan, things we're looking at. Why don't we add this to a five-year plan? And, yet, and I don't know if that goes under policy or academics or what have you, but it just came along. Kind of a discussion. We'll file that up here. Thank you. Any other <laughs> questions? <laughs> I just want to know, how, how would you like me to proceed at this point with this? Right. I would, I would say we probably would look at what some of the alternatives were. To work with. I would recommend we work with the policy that we have at the moment as far as what you're looking for for the next school year. So some something more concrete can come about. I'd like to go with the administration's suggestion. They're, they're the ones that have to work. 
the yeah. students, that they know the needs of the students more yeah. than we know the needs of the students. But if they come back within two months with something, I mean, yeah. this has to be a focus of theirs. Or will, will, it be, yeah. will it be timely? But two months, I mean, if, if, if we can do it in a timely manner, I would agree. If, if it has to yeah. go right away, then it has to go for about two steps. I, I would, that would vote in favor of what they want to do for now. With what the, uh, I mean, you did say this isn't going to hurt any students. No, if they not want to take it, they can take the class. But, it's, but, but if we don't make a decision by what is it, the end of June, then we have to staff those for next year, which is a quarter of a million dollars. I, mean, that's, I, I think, you know, as she said, we didn't have to do it this month, but I think by April or early May, they ought to have, they need that decision because now what it does, it creates a burden on the workload, correct me if I'm wrong, because if the students select all that, you then